Administrative matters that we need to take up before we proceed. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so by, by our count and per the uh, emails that the parties have been exchanging at the end of every day, uh, so far the plaintiffs have used 24 hours and 17 minutes, and the defense side has used 24 hours and 3 minutes. So by our calculation, uh, and, and again, the parties' agreement was that by the end of the week, two weeks of trial, we would just each have used the same amount of time. So we're 14 minutes in the red ahead of them, so they get an additional 14 minutes today. So, Mr. Jones, so is, what I'm understanding you saying is that you are asking the defendants to reserve for the plaintiffs the amount of time uh, equal to what they use less 14 minutes or the difference, whatever the difference actually is. Correct. All right. And we can go back and check the math too. The parties have been exchanging emails at the end of each trial day with the agreed breakdown of time, so it's just a pure right. matter. All right. Well, why don't you all confer on that? Um, it seems like the arrangement has worked very well thus far, and uh, so I'm sure that you can come up with a precise allocation of time that remains. Unless you have an objection, I don't see any reason why we can't go ahead and call Dr. Barber while folks uh, confer about the time. Sure. There, there's one other administrative matter I was going to raise this morning, which relates to the, uh, the post-trial submissions. Yes. So um, we, we, of course, will do whatever the court likes, whatever we just want to be uh, helpful to the court and the rest of the process. Our uh, intention had been to submit just a single set of proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law um, and not to submit an additional post-trial legal brief, which we thought would, um, you know, particularly with, uh, from our perspective, time being of the essence, um, I think a post-trial brief would from our perspective, probably just be largely redundant of our proposed uh, legal conclusions. Um, so, but I wanted to raise it now in case your honors wanted to, to confer um, either on a break or at lunch and just let us know if there's any direction that you wanted to provide in terms of what we can do to be, to be useful and helpful. Mr. Branch, did you? I, I believe we've been operating under the belief that there would be a post trial break, um, but I can confer my co counsel and let the court. Yes, Your Honor. We'll just chat about that and then uh, we'll uh, confer with the plaintiff's right. counsel and get back to you. That's fine. I, I, you know, it certainly could be that the conclusions of law, uh, if they were stated with specificity, would suffice to make whatever arguments you might otherwise make in a formal memoranda. So I can see that the be substantial overlap. Uh, we obviously would be interested in the legal position, so uh, if you choose to do it that way, we would we would certainly want uh, sufficient detail that we can understand the legal arguments that you're raising. Uh, but 
I'm not sure that as a matter of principle we would we would say that would not be appropriate to submit one document that consolidates findings, conclusions, and contains the legal basis upon which you think. Your Honor, again, we just like to talk about that because I'm not sure that we agree with that. It might okay. be better for the court if there was a short trial brief to kind of summarize things. So we'll just okay. discuss it amongst ourselves and talk about it. All right, that's fine. Um, it, I'm assuming that parties are waiving closing arguments, or do you wish to make final arguments in this case? Well, I, I don't believe there's going to be time given the three witnesses today. Um, if, there, if there were time, I suppose we'd uh, be interested in presenting a short closing, but I, I don't believe there will be. Oh, Your Honor, it just depends on what time's left. I think if there's time left and the court will hear closing arguments, uh, we'll be prepared to give one, but I agree with Mr. Jones that there may not be any time left. All right. Mr. Branch. The most uh, appropriate statement yesterday was when Mr. Branch said that if we're not done by five, there won't be a panel here. Yes. Anything else, yes. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one scheduling matter today, if we could run till about 1.15 before we take a lunch break, um, I have a, a meeting back at the courthouse that would be helpful if I could get to at least a short part of it, and that would help me may be able to do that. So we would take the 115 and take them the normal hour and a half lunch recess and resume at, at 245, so just for your planning purposes. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, if there's nothing else, then we will uh, uh, pr proceed with uh, the examination of, Ms. of Dr. Barber. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Barber, good morning. Good morning. Um, now, we ended yesterday with you giving the court an overview of Dr. Cooper's opinions and your analysis of them. Given the intervening time, I'd appreciate it if you could quickly go back through those and provide, a co provide the court with a brief overview or essentially roadmap of the testimony that you intend, of Dr. Cooper's opinions and the analysis you intend to give of those opinions. Sure. Um, so my, uh, my understanding of the conclusions or opinions offered by Dr. Cooper are that he speaks to um, three broad points. The first being, <coughs> excuse me, the first being um, uh, the uh, the ideology of the North Carolina electorate um, and his opinion being that the electorate uh, is quite moderate. The second uh, opinion that he offers is one of the ideological composition of the state legislature. Um, and again, uh, that the legislature has historically been moderate uh, and that that is not the case presently and that in, in the present legislature, uh, the composition of the uh, uh, legislature is quite conservative. Um, my understanding of his opinion uh, of the relationship between those two things, between the electorate and the legislature, is that there is a disconnect between those two bodies and that the primary reason for that disconnect has to do with uh, the process of redistricting. And would you summarize your conclusions regarding Dr. Cooper's analysis of the court, please? Yes. Um, so taking each of those in point, um, it's my opinion that the, the data that Dr. Cooper uses to draw the conclusions that he does about the electorate simply don't allow us to draw those conclusions. Um, <clears throat> He draws on two sources of data, uh, and in the first source of data, uh, those, those data don't really speak at all to the ideological composition of the electorate. They don't really connect in any way. Uh, the second source of data are, a, in my view, a better source. Uh, however, even in that case, uh, the way in which the data are collected and aggregated um, aggregate 
in the, in the process of aggregation, uh, you lose all of the information that you would really want to have to draw conclusions about the, ideolo the ideological composition of the electorate. Um, what that does is it then makes it incredibly difficult to say anything about how that connects to the composition of the legislature. Um, furthermore, looking at the legislature, um, it's the case that if you look over a larger historical period than Dr. Cooper does in his report, that it is not at all the case that the legislature has been historically moderate. And by moderate, I think Dr. Cooper is actually referring to competitive. Uh, I think those two terms are used um, somewhat interchangeably, and, and I, I believe incorrectly so. Uh, and then finally, uh, in the connection between the electorate and uh, the legislature, um, I discuss an alternative or an additional factor that should be considered uh, when talking about how the electorate connects to the legislature, which is that the political geography of the state uh, is such that that's a, a likely explanation as well for uh, filters between the, uh, the, legis or the, the electorate and the legislature. Thank you, Dr. Barber. Um, now, moving on to a little bit more of a detailed discussion of the conclusions reached by Dr. Cooper, can you first talk about Dr. Cooper's opinion that the North Carolina electorate is, on average, moderate. Please discuss your concerns about that opinion, which was reached by Dr. Cooper. Sure. So the, the first source of data that Dr. Cooper uses is from a, an academic study by Barry et al. And um, the data that's used in that study actually don't, uh, they don't use any uh, information about the opinions on policy of the electorate. And this is a a data set that is national, but it also includes North Carolina as part of the study. Um, instead, the data are, are based on the voting behavior of legislators. And then uh, what they do is they take uh, averages, weighted averages of those uh, legislators' voting behavior, and they use that as a proxy for the ideological composition of the electorate. The problem is that in his report, Dr. Cooper makes the, the argument that there is a disconnect between the legislature and the electorate, which by that argument, you shouldn't then use a data set of legislative behavior to draw conclusions about the electorate. Um, it's either one or the other. And so in that way, I, I just believe that that data set is not suited to make any sort of claims about the composition of the electorate. The second data set that um, Dr. Cooper uses is from uh, Warshawn to Sanovich. And this is a, uh, a collection of responses of public opinion uh, from uh, voters in North Carolina. Again, this is a national data set, but uh, we're looking here specifically at North Carolina. Um, in this case, it's my view that this data set is an improvement in that it uses public opinion data to talk about the ideological composition of the electorate. The problem here is that the data are aggregated at a very high level. They take a, a large number of policy responses and aggregate those together to produce a, a single number, um, an average ideology for each voter, which is then averaged together to create an average ideology of the state overall. The problem with that is that it doesn't allow you to say anything about how the electorate uh, view any particular issue, because those issues are all aggregated together. So when you come out with a moderate score for a, a particular voter or a group of voters, what you've got is you have an open question as to on which issues are voters moderate, because moderate could mean a few things. It could mean that voters are truly middle of the road on all of these issues that have been put into this study. However, it could also mean that voters are very conservative on some issues and very liberal on a, another set of issues that when averaged together produce a score of moderation. Uh, and there's a lot of political science research to suggest that that's exactly the case for most voters. Most voters hold uh, a grab bag of ideological views, some conservative, some liberal, and when you put those together, into an average score, you get something that looks moderate. Um, the problem with drawing conclusions about that to what the legislature should look like is 
average together, if you're a legislator and you're looking at that data, it tells you nothing about on which issues your constituents would want you to vote in a conservative way and on which issues your constituents would want you to vote on a liberal way. It just tells you that my constituents are mixed. Uh, and so when you look at the legislature and the voting behavior of the legislature, uh, and you know, legislatures are voting over particular issues, you, from these data you can't say anything about whether a legislator is voting with or not with the majority of his or her constituents. It just doesn't allow you to line those things up. Um, <clears throat> so that's, those are my concerns on, on the ideological composition of the electorate. So essentially is it that people are complicated and by aggregating the complicated nature of people you can artificially inflate the so-called moderate measure of the electorate? Yeah, I think it's people are, people are mixed. People uh, have a variety of views over policy and uh, some of those are conservative and some of those are liberal and even people who identify with a political party also hold a variety of political issues. So people who identify as being Democrats uh, often have a mixture of conservative and liberal views. Uh, voters who identify as Republicans, it's the same way. They often have a variety of views, uh, both in the conservative and liberal direction. Did you have any opinion on Dr. Cooper's use of the term moderate as a descriptor of the um, North Carolina electorate? Of the electorate? Um, or of the legislature? So I think I've more or less described my concerns about the term moderate in terms of the electorate, um, simply that it, it could mean a variety of things. In, in terms of the legislature, I think that there's also a concern about the use of the term moderate, because I, I think that in, in his report, he's in some ways talking about moderation, but also talking about competitiveness. Um, and, and Dr. Cooper points out that over the, over the past few years, um, in the kind of mid to late 2000s that the legislature has indeed been quite competitive. Uh, the, the which party controls the majority has, has been up in the air uh, over the last several sessions. Uh, however, historically that's not been the case at all. Um, and in my report I produce a, a figure that shows the historical composition of the state legislature. And, and let, the, let the record reflect this is Intervenor Defendant's Trial Exhibit 001, which is located at tab three of the binder. And, and can you continue your explanation as to what this figure is? So this is a figure that I produced um, that shows, it's probably better to look at the binder because the projector is not showing half of it. Um, that shows the proportion of seats in the legislature controlled by uh, the, Democ the Democratic Party, uh, and the dark line shows the state house, or I'm sorry, the state senate, and the the light colored line uh, on the paper shows the state house. Although it doesn't look like the the light colored line is showing up on the the screen. Um, and and what we can see is that is it, it is indeed the case that over the past few decades uh, that the the composition of the legislature has been quite competitive. So uh, it, the control of the legislature has uh, bounced ac across parties a few times. But historically, I think there are two things to take away. One, that's not always been the case. Uh, looking back even further, it, it's much more the case that the Democratic Party has held very large majorities in the state legislature. <coughs> Uh, the other thing that I think is important to point out here is that there's a, a very uh, long and persistent trend that has been occurring over the last 50 or 60 years in which the legislature has more or less been moving in the direction of or moving from near unanimous control by the Democratic Party uh, with a, a very, I guess you could say, kind of persistent trend away from that towards um, stronger or larger majorities uh, for the Republican Party. What or can you summarize your opinion regarding Dr. Cooper's conclusion of the connection between voters purported moderate ideology in North Carolina and the composition of the General Assembly? Yes. So 
I, I simply don't think that you can say much about uh, what we would expect the General Assembly to look like in terms of its partisan composition, given the data that Dr. Cooper has looked at on the ideological composition of the electorate. Um, it just doesn't tell us about what types of legislators we should expect to see in the legislature, uh, both in terms of what party we would expect them to come from, and furthermore, as to what types of, of, of votes they would take um, once they're in office. And so I just, I just don't think you can draw conclusions about the connection of those two things given the data that Dr. Cooper has uh, used in his report. And can you please um, inform the court where in your expert report at tab one you summarize the conclusions you just testified to regarding Dr. Cooper's opinion on the moderation of the North Carolina electorate in the General Assembly? Uh, so this is contained in my report in section one, uh, which is on page four through uh, page 10 of my report. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barber. Uh, I believe the next conclusion reached by Dr. Cooper was an observation about the proportion of votes received statewide by Democrat legislative candidates in 2018 and how that proportion, in their opinion, did not favorably compare to the number of legislative seats won by Democratic candidates. Can you describe your understanding of Dr. Cooper's opinion to the court? Uh, yes. So Dark Cooper points specifically to the 2018 um, election, and I, I quote from his report on page 10 of my report, um, and Dr. Cooper says, specifically Democratic candidates won 51.1 percent of the two-party statewide vote in 2018 State House elections, but won only 55 of 120 seats, 45.8 Democratic candidates won 51.2 percent of the two-party statewide vote in 2018 state senate elections, but won only 21 of 50 seats, 42 uh, percent. I believe Dr. Cooper referred to his report in his report a concept called the seats votes ratio. As a political science scientist, can you talk to the court about what the seats votes ratio is? and how that is relevant to your analysis? Sure, and we saw a little bit of this discussion yesterday as well. Um, the seats votes ratio is a term that we use in political science that simply talks about the translation of votes across a, a large uh, geographic area into uh, individual legislative seats. And, and um, that's, you can use that term anytime you're talking about a, a legislative body that's divided up into multiple districts. Uh, you can talk about that in terms of Congress and looking nationally, but you can also talk about that uh, at a state level. And uh, what you're doing is you're saying, well, let's look at the number of votes or the proportion of votes that are won across the entire state by a particular party. And then let's look at the proportion of seats that are earned by the, that same party. And uh, in many cases, those numbers aren't exactly the same, and that's because in, an, in legislative bodies, we divide the area up into various districts, and the votes in each of those districts may not necessarily be the same across all of the districts. Uh, Dr. Barber, I believe in your report, you used a hypothetical example to illustrate this. Um, your Honor's the hypotheticals that were contained in his report are located at tab four of your binder. They are intervener defendants exhibits two, three, and five. Um, behind tab five of the binder is a demonstrative exhibit that actually has all three of those stacked together. If we could display the demonstrative, there we go. And then Dr. Barber, can you explain what this is and how it's relevant to your analysis, please? Sure. So this is an extremely simplified example of what we've been talking about. Uh, and so what I've done here is I've created a, a hypothetical 
rectangular state. And in this hypothetical state, uh, I've divided the state up into 32 hypothetical precincts. And I've labeled them P1, P2, so forth, through P32. Uh, and in this hypothetical example, um, I've said, imagine that voters are distributed perfectly evenly across the state, both geographically, uh, but also in terms of their partisan preferences. And so statewide, um, the electorate prefer Democratic candidates by a, f a small majority, 51%. Um, and that's true of every precinct in the state. Well, what that means is no matter how you draw districts in this simplified example, um, the Democratic candidates are always going to win. So in the top example, I've drawn districts by putting vertical lines down the state. Um, and you can see in every uh, one of those districts, the Democratic candidates are going to win 51% of the vote. Uh, which means they're going to win 100% of the seats in this four-person le four legislature. Uh, the same is true if you draw the lines horizontally across the, the state, and you're going to get the exact same outcome. Um, and then in the third example, if you draw the boundaries in a kind of cattywampus way, um, sorry, I don't, that was a really bad word to use for the court reporter, <laughs> uh, in an unusual way, uh, you're going to end up with the same outcome. You're going to get, uh, again, 51% of the vote for the Democratic candidate in each of the districts. The, again, I should emphasize, this is a very, very simplified example. There's no state that actually looks like this. Uh, but I think that the simplicity of the example helps to illustrate the point that we're, we're trying to get at here, which is that uh, the seats to votes ratio um, is a function of the geographic dispersion of voters across the state, uh, as well as their, the dispersion of partisan preferences across the state as well. Given your research in this matter, how closely have seats and votes lined up in North Carolina history? And if your honors can turn to tab six in the binder, binder and can we please display intervener defendants trial exhibit six? So that hypothetical example, of course, as I said, is not North Carolina. Um, this figure actually shows election results and um, legislative results for North Carolina from 1970 to the present. And the way to understand this figure is um, every point represents an election result and uh, the circles are the state house and the triangles are the state senate. The horizontal axis shows the votes portion of the seats votes relationship. And so this shows the proportion of the statewide vote that was won by Democratic candidates. The vertical axis shows the seats portion of the seats votes relationship. And so this shows the proportion of seats won by uh, Democratic candidates in each of the two chambers. The diagonal line that runs through the figure shows the point of equality. So this would be, if a point falls on that line, that would be the point at which, which the statewide vote share perfectly matched the seat share earned by uh, Democrats in that particular election. What you see is that it's rarely the case that the points fall along the line. Sometimes they're above the line, sometimes they're below the line. Uh, and you know they generally follow a positive trend, which you would expect. As a party does better statewide, you would expect them, on average, to do better in the number of seats that they earn. Uh, but there's a, you know, it's a, it's not a perfect relationship. There's a, some noise in there. Given your research into North Carolina election results, how rare is it for a political party to win the majority of the statewide two-party vote for a House of the General Assembly? but not to win enough seats for control of that house. So in, in the recent history of the state, it's, it's actually not as rare as you might think. Um, tab 7, the second page of tab 7, shows a table of the numbers that you just looked at in that figure. So this is just the numbers that are behind the figure that we looked at. Um, and if you look uh, across the bottom row, you can see the numbers that uh, Dr. Cooper 
points to in his report, the 2018 election. We see that the, in the House, which is the left portion of numbers, uh, the Republicans won 48.8% of the statewide vote, but obtained 54% of the seats in the chamber. And uh, moving across to the Senate, you see that Republican candidates won 49.4% of the statewide vote, uh, but were seated in 58% of the seats. Uh, however, there are five other occasions in which that has happened since 1994, um, except for the, other, uh, for the other parties. So if you look at in the House, um, and I believe they're highlighted up here on the screen. In 2006, Republicans won uh, a little more than 50% of the statewide vote, but obtained 43% of the seats in the, uh, in the House. In 2004, uh, Republicans won 52% of the statewide vote, uh, but only 47.5% of the seats. And then again in 2000, uh, Republicans won a little less than 52% of the statewide vote, uh, but earned only 48% of the seats. And then looking across to the Senate, you can see similar results for 2004 and 2002, in which in both cases the Republican <coughs> candidates won uh, a slim majority of statewide votes, uh, but obtained less than a majority of the seats in the legislature, in this case in the Senate. Thank you, Dr. Barber. Now, how do you believe that your analysis of the seats votes issue should impact the court's consideration of Dr. Cooper's opinion? Well, I think that first it points to the fact that the outcome in 2018 is not uh, a unique anomaly. It's occurred in the past. Um, and so I think that's an important point. Um, to, to take away as, uh, and then more broadly to simply understand that uh, statewide votes don't always translate to a perfect uh, mirror image of seats in the legislature. And can you please orient the court as to where in your report you summarize the testimony you've just given on the seats votes issue? Uh, yes, so this is in section three of my report from pages 10 through 14. Thank you, Dr. Barber. Um, moving on to another area of your opinion, did you look into another factor that could have caused the 2018 seats votes issue identified by Dr. Cooper other than just where the legislative district lines are placed? Uh, I did, yes. So. In that very simplified hypothetical example, I made the assumption that voters were distributed perfectly evenly across the little rectangular state. Um, in North Carolina, that's certainly not the case. And so in, in a, another portion of my report, I looked to, to see whether and how voters are distributed geographically across the state in terms of both their population density, uh, but also in terms of their partisan preferences and how those two things are related to one another in the state. And can you describe what prompted you to begin looking into this issue? Well, there's a lot of academic research that points to political geography uh, as an important factor in the, in the representation and in legislatures. Um, and so looking at that would uh, would, would, I guess, suggest that that is something that, that should be uh, investigated. And are there any specific articles that you have looked into that discuss this um, analysis? So there's uh, one that's included in the binder that I uh, am familiar with and have read and uh, kind of points to this as something to, of interest, uh, which is an article published in the Quarterly Journal of Political <coughs> Science. Um, by Dr. Chen and Rodin called Unintentional Gerrymandering, Political Geography, and Electoral Bias in Legislatures. And, and this is, Your Honors, this is at tab 16 of the binder. This is Legislative Defendants Trial Exhibit 154. And was this article 
is the Dr. Chen who's listed as an author of this article the same Dr. Chen that testified for three days earlier in this trial? Uh, yes, it is. And can you describe the, the conclusions that were reached by Dr. Chen and his co-author, Dr. Roden, and, and Madam Court Reporter, that's R-O-D-D-E-N? Um, I, I think reading the abstract is probably the easiest way to get a flavor for what the article says. Um, and the abstract says, while conventional wisdom holds that partisan bias in U.S. legislative elections results from intentional partisan and racial gerrymandering, we demonstrate that substantial bias can also emerge from patterns of human geography. We show that in many states, Democrats are inefficiently concentrated in large cities and smaller industrial agglomerations, such that they can expect to win fewer than 50% of the seats when they win 50% of the votes. To measure this unintentional gerrymandering, we use automated districting simulations based on precinct level 2000 presidential election results in several states. Our results illustrate a strong relationship between the geographic concentration of Democratic voters and electoral bias favoring Republicans. Uh, does the Chin and Roden study include North Carolina in its analysis? Uh, no, it does not. It, does this prevent the applicability of their findings to North Carolina? No, I think it instead invites the question as to what would it look like if we look to see if this relationship also existed in North Carolina. How did you test whether or not uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Roden's findings could be applicable to North Carolina? So I should first say there's a, a number of analyses that they conduct in this article. Um, and it was not my intention to replicate everything that they have done in this article. Um, I was specifically interested in the statement that they make about Democrats are inefficiently concentrated in large cities and smaller industrial agglomerations. And so I looked to see if it is indeed the case that in North Carolina um, that places that are more densely populated also tend to be more supportive of Democratic candidates in the state. And how did you test whether places in North Carolina that are more densely populated support Democratic candidates in a higher amount? So there are two variables that we would need to, to test that. The first is a measure of population density, and the second is a measure of partisan support. And so I uh, used a variety of different data sets to bring together all of those variables, population density and um, the tendency to support one party or the other. How did you calculate the voter population density information uh, and on what geographic level did you do so? So I, I did this at the VTD level and also at the county level. Um, and to measure population density, you need two things, a measure of the size of the units you're studying and the number of people who live in that area. Um, to measure the size of VTDs, I obtained um, geographic information system shape files that contain the boundaries of VTDs in North Carolina. Uh, they not only include the boundaries, but they also include a measure of the geographic size of each VTD. Um, to then bring population size into that equation, um, I used the statewide voter file and uh, geolocated voters into VTDs um, to get the number of registered voters in each VTD from either, for either party or neither party, just the, the total number of voters. And together, that gives you the population density uh, of VTDs. I used the exact same procedure, but simply looking at counties instead of VTDs as well. And if I could direct the court to tab 8 in the binder, this is Intervenor Defendant's Trial Exhibit 007. Um, Dr. Barber, can you describe what this is for the court, please? Sure. This is a map that shows the population density of VTDs. Um, and the coloring on the screen is a little hard to make out, but on the right-hand side of the figure, you can see the scale. And what you see is darker colors, uh, particularly green in this case, indicate more densely populated areas of the state. 
uh, and lighter colors indicate more sparsely populated areas of the state. Um, there are, I think, two main things to take away here. The first is that most of the state geographically is very sparsely populated. There are a lot of rural, uh, rural areas of the state. The second is that the most densely populated VTDs tend to be in areas, or tend to be in the urban areas of the state. Um, and so you can see on the map that they more or less follow the, this crescent shape from Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, up into the Winston-Salem <coughs> Uh, triad area and then down into Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. Um, and so those areas are going to be shaded very dark green. Um, and it, it, it's the case that there, these areas are so densely populated that the, pr the printed version is often not the greatest way to look at this. If you were to zoom in to these areas, you would see many, many more of the VTDs than the, they're colored very darkly, uh, indicating a very uh, dense population. And, and I will let the court know the the electronic file that was produced to the plaintiffs in connection with Dr. Cooper's April 30th report and which has been submitted to the court as an exhibit in this case does contain sufficient detail to allow the court to zoom in on the uh, more densely populated areas to see those VTD lines. Um, uh, Dr. Barber, did you also uh, evaluate the population density issue at a different level than just the VTD level? Uh, yes. Uh, so as I, I said earlier, I also did this at the county level. And so um, tab 10 shows the results of that analysis, again, in a map, um, but this time simply looking at counties instead of VTDs. Um, for the next, I think the next for, hold on, for the record, we're displaying intervener defendants. Um, this was 008. And also for the record, uh, Your Honors, we included at tab 9 in the notebook intervener defendants demonstrative exhibit 002. Um, Force. If we could display 002 first, and Dr. Barber, can you just describe for the record what the demonstrative exhibit oh, is? Uh, yeah. That's the same map that we were just looking at. It simply includes labels for some of the large, largest cities in the state, just to orient people as they look at the map of VTDs. And then let's go ahead and go to tab 10, 008. And uh, Dr. Barber, can you just explain for the court why you performed your population density analysis on both the VTD and the county level? So there are a few reasons. One is simply as a robustness check to just see if, if the patterns hold at a different level of geography. Uh, and we would expect that to be the case because the more densely populated VTDs are also going to then translate up to more densely populated counties. Um, the other reason is that given North Carolina's unique uh, statute regarding whole county provisions that has been discussed here a number of times, it would be informative to also look at the, the county level. Thank you. Uh, what did you do after analyzing and mapping the population density of voters in North Carolina? So that was half of the equation. The other half was a measure of partisan support or average partisan support for these same units. And so in that case, I uh, used data from the North Carolina State Board of Elections um, to create an index of partisan support. And um, in that way, we can get a, a, a measure of how the, the tendency of VTDs or counties uh, to vote for Democratic candidates. So essentially, you created your own partisan voter index? That's correct. Uh, can we, Your Honor, turn to tab 11 in the binder? This is trial ex intervener defendants trial exhibit 015. And then, Dr. Barber, can you explain what this is and essentially how, you cre how and why you created your partisan voter index? Yeah, so this is a simple table that shows the elections that I used to create that index. Uh, so I used the, uh, the Senate race, the, the federal Senate race in 2014, 
uh, and then the governor, lieutenant governor, and secretary of state races in 2012. Um, those together, I averaged those four elections um, to create a measure of the tendency of an area to support Democratic candidates uh, versus Republican candidates. And why did you choose these four elections? So I chose statewide elections, and that would allow that allows for uh, a more comparable result across the state, since all voters in the state are choosing between the same two candidates. Um, I chose multiple elections so that we could create an average, and so no one particular election is uh, going to be driving the results, um, so that you can avoid the idiosyncrasies of any particular election. Um, I, I chose four simply because that was what I had time to do. Um, however, I would note that in later addition of uh, ad additional elections that are added in 2012 do not change the results at all. All right, and, and was one of the factors that you were considering the information available to voters in statewide races? Well, these are also races that tend to have more uh, coverage that are more kind of attention paid to them. Uh, and so we might think that voters are more informed or the kind of most informed about these races versus other down ballot races. There's been a lot of testimony at this trial about Dr. Thomas Hoffler. Did you know who he was prior to being engaged as an expert in this case? No. And were you aware of a partisan index purportedly found on Dr. Hoffler's computer backup files when you prepared your report in this case? No, I was not. Okay. How did you use the four elections to create the partisan index which you were able to then apply to at the VTD and county level? Uh, so I simply took the average of the four elections, uh, which means that um, the the scale ranges from zero to one. Um, uh, a value of zero would indicate a VTD or a county that unanimously supported Republican candidates. Uh, a value of one would indicate a VTD or a county that unanimously supported all of the Democratic candidates in this measure. Uh, no VTD or county has a value of zero or one, uh, but it is the case that the VTDs do span a pretty big portion of the scale. There's some very strongly Republican VTDs in the state, uh, unsurprisingly, and there's unsurprisingly some very strongly Democratic VTDs in the state as well. And do you recall the range of the actual values that you found on your scale? Uh, I, it's reported in my um, report. I believe it's like point zero. Oof something <laughs> and 0.9 something so it's it's from very low to very high on this on the scale okay let's uh, can we display um, intervener defendants trial exhibit 009 at tab 12 of the binder and, and dr. Barber can you explain what this map is and, and how it reflects your analysis Certainly. So this, again, is the VTDs in the state, and this just shows a mapping of that partisan index. So lighter colors indicate VTDs that are uh, strongly Republican. Dark blue colors indicate VTDs that are strongly Democratic. Um, and you can see that there's variety or variation, uh, significant variation across the state. Um, dark, there, as you, as you look at the various cities, um, you see very uh, dark blue spots across the state. Um, but there are also some VTDs that are dark blue in other portions of the state. Um, these bigger VTDs tend to be uh, very rural, sparsely populated uh, areas, if you remember back from the population density map that we looked at. Um, and then these urban VTDs tend to be very um, very densely populated, uh, if you recall from the population density map that we looked at a few minutes ago. And, and to be clear, the darker blue on this map does not reflect a more dense population, but it reflects a more democratic population. Is that right? Right. This map is, uh, is not, does not show population density. It shows partisan support. Okay. Or I should say average partisan support. Can we display Intervener defendants, trial exhibits 11 and 12 side by side 
And your honors, this is at tab 14 of your binder. Um, Dr. Barber, can you explain what these are and uh, the conclusions that you are able to draw from this? Sure. So we now have a measure of population density. We have a measure of partisan support, average partisan support. And these are scatter plots that simply look at the relationship between those two variables. Uh, the left panel shows that relationship for the VTDs, and the right panel shows that relationship for the counties. Each point or each dot in each figure is either one VTD or one county. And so you can see there are many fewer dots on the right hand side because there are only 100 counties, whereas there are several thousand VTDs. The size of the dots are um, <coughs> proportionate to the total population of the unit. So you can see the two most populous counties over here. Uh, and then on the left, you can see that the VTDs vary in size as well. Um, the horizontal axis shows the population density of each of the units. And so points further to the right are more densely populated units. The vertical axis shows the average partisan support for Democratic candidates. And so points at the bottom are going to be uh, locations that are very strong Republican areas and points towards the top are going to be points that are very strongly Democratic areas. Um, the red line in each figure shows what's called the line of best fit. And this is simply uh, the best linear relationship. This is the, the, the relationship that we estimate between those two variables. What we see is that in both cases the line is positive, which means that we expect on average as population density increases, support for Democratic candidates also tends to increase. And that's true at both the county and VTD level. And I believe in your report you analyzed this relationship in two different ways. Um, can you describe the other way? And I think, can we also pull up now is it tab 15 of the binder, Intervenor Defendants Trial Exhibit 16? Yes, so another way to look at these same data is by using what's called a regression analysis. And a regression is simply uh, a more precise way of estimating the correlation between two variables. Um, and so, um, the results in this table are, are going to look very similar to the results in the figure. They're just going to be quantified in a more precise way. Um, there are a number of regressions included in this uh, table, but the, one, the ones that I'll point out are uh, at the VTD level on the right-hand side, um, the estimated relationship between population density and Democratic vote shares in the VTD is we see that in the 0 0.09 number. Uh, that's right. Oh. I was going to write on the screen, but that number right there. Um, and, and the way to interpret that, it's, that's called a coefficient. The way to interpret that is to say, for every increase in 1,000 people per square mile, we would expect to observe a nine percentage point increase in average Democratic support. Um, similarly, at the county level, the coefficient in that regression model is 0 0.068, which um, again, the interpretation is for every increase in 1,000 people per square mile, we would expect to observe a 6.8 percentage point increase in average Democratic support in the, in the county. What, what overall conclusions are you able to draw from your VTD and county level partisan index analysis? So the results from the figures that we looked at and the results from the regression table are in line with one another and both of them suggest that there does tend to be a positive relationship between these two variables. That 
population density and democratic support uh, for candidates are positively correlated with one another. Um, is this consistent with the analysis and conclusions reached by Dr. Chen and Dr. Roden in the uh, Quarterly Journal of Political Science article, uh, which has been designated as Legislative Defendants Trial Exhibit 154? Uh, yes, I think it is. Um, if you recall, they said that we show that in many states, Democrats are inefficiently concentrated in large cities and smaller industrial agglomerations. And that pattern does also appear to be true of North Carolina. Okay, and Force, can you pull up the trial transcript from July 15th in the afternoon? Um, Page 70, 70 to 71, I'm going to highlight 70 line 18 to 71 9. Yeah, it's page 70, line 18 through 71, line 9, please. And Dr. Barber, I will represent to you that this is the trial testimony of Representative Meyer, which occurred earlier, I believe on the first day of trial in this case. And what I'd like you to do is read the highlighted language into the record. The, oh, okay, hold on. This, oh, sorry. My apologies, I should have set this up better. All right, what I'd like you to do is just read the highlighted portion of the um, transcript. In your recruiting of candidates, since you were able to recruit them in every district, did you recruit candidates in geographic areas where the Democrats had not had candidates recently? Yes, sir. What areas would those have been? I mean, most of those areas were rural districts. May have been a small number of urban or exurban districts where that was true. So is it safe to say that the Democratic voters are more concentrated in urban areas than Republican voters? I believe that that's, that's true. And that's reflected then in the fact that you had to go out and recruit harder in areas where you had not traditionally had candidates in rural areas because the Democratic support was weak, weaker. That's right. And is Representative Meyer's statements here consistent with your opinion in this case? Uh, yes, I think broadly they are. Um, regarding the geographic distribution of Democratic and Republican voters, I think my analysis shows that it is indeed the case that Democratic voters tend to be more strongly clustered in uh, the urban and densely, more densely populated portions of the state. Okay. I have no further questions. Cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. And before we begin, may I have my co-counsel uh, pass out the cross-examination binders to the court, the witness and opposing counsel? Yes,
May I proceed, yes, Your Honor? So. so good morning, Dr. Barber. Good morning. My name is John Sella. I'm counsel for the plaintiffs in this case. And we met back last month in June at your deposition. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And I know you've come into North Carolina for this trial this week. You were coming from Florida, right? That's correct. Well, I, via Utah. Okay, so you took a stop at home in Utah on the way? At the recommendation of my wife, yes. <laughs> Probably a good idea. <laughs> Last week you were in Florida though, right? That's correct. And you were testifying at a different case there, right? Correct. And there you were being paid to testify by the Republican Governors Association, is that right? I believe so, yes. And you were being paid to testify there also by the National Republican Senatorial Committee, is that right? Yes, I believe so. Okay. And you're being paid for your testimony today by the Republican Party as well, is that right? Correct. Specifically the National Republican Cong Congressional Committee? I believe that's the case. Okay. Dr. Barber, before coming in this week for a trial, you had only been to North Carolina three times, is that right? Correct. You mentioned that you applied to Duke for grad school, right? That's correct. So you came in one time to visit campus during that graduate school application process, right? Yes. Came to a visitation weekend? Correct. Okay. Uh, but you like New Jersey better, right? That's debatable. <laughs> I liked the, I preferred the program that Princeton offered okay. uh, to, to Duke's program. So you didn't come to Duke? No, I did not. All right. The other two times that you've been in North Carolina was on vacation, right? Correct. In the Outer Banks? Correct. In Kerala? Correct. All right. You haven't visited any other parts of North Carolina? Uh, no, aside from now being here in Raleigh. This is your first time in Raleigh? Correct. Okay. And I don't think the words North Carolina appear anywhere in your curriculum vitae, is that right? I believe that's the case, yes. Dr. Barber, you talked about some of your academic papers. None of your published acad academic papers concern redistricting. Is that right? Correct. None of your academic papers discuss North Carolina politics, do they? Correct. Redistricting has not been a focus of your academic research. That's correct. And redistricting in North Carolina is not something that you had given a lot of thought to before you were contacted by the Council for Interveners in this case. Is that right? I think that's, uh, yeah, that's broadly true, yes. Okay. It's not something you've published about? No. Um, we already talked about how, to, how none of your published papers discuss or concern redistricting. Um, Redistricting is not, in North Carolina, is not something you've taught about either. Correct. And it's not something that you've ever spent any time analyzing before you were contacted for, by counsel for the Republican intervener defendants in this case. Correct. Okay. So just to be clear at the outset, all of the opinions and the analysis that you've done in your work in this case um, they are all offered in response to Dr. Cooper's opinions and analysis. Is that right? Yes. Your expert report is titled, Report in Response to Report of Dr. Christopher Cooper. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. You are not commenting on any other expert's work in this case. Is that right? No. So you're not commenting on Dr. Joey Chen's analysis and conclusions that he's reached and testified about in this case? No, I'm not commenting about the simulations that we've seen in the last week or so. And you're not commenting about anything that Dr. Chen has, has testified to, right? No, not of his testimony here. Okay. And you're not commenting on anything that Dr. Mattingly has testified to and any of the conclusions that he's reached and shared with the court in this case, is that right? Correct. And you're not commenting on any of the conclusions and analysis that Dr. Pegden performed and shared with the court in this case. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Because you haven't even reviewed any of their original expert reports that were submitted in the case, correct? That's correct. Okay. 
and you're not even fully aware of all of the analysis that those other experts conducted, right? That's correct, as I've not seen their original reports. Right, okay. So you're just providing opinions in response to Dr. Cooper. Um, but even within that, you haven't conducted any analysis of the specific district boundaries that Dr. Cooper looked at in his expert analysis. Is that right? No, as I said earlier, I was not offering opinions about where particular districts should, should or should not be drawn. Well, you're not offering any opinions at all about specific district boundaries that are at issue in this case, right? Correct. And you're not offering any opinions on Dr. Cooper's analysis of those specific district boundaries that are at issue in this case, right? Not of the specific districts, no. You haven't even looked at the specific district lines that we're here in court discussing, right? I mean, I've seen them as they've been presented by other people, um, if that's what you're asking. So you've seen them on the map. You haven't conducted any analysis beyond that, right? That's correct. Okay. And you're not offering any alternative explanations for where those specific district lines are on the map, right? No, with regard to the specific district boundaries, no. So nobody from the General Assembly ever told you why these districts were drawn the, the way they are, correct? I've never spoken to anyone from the General Assembly. So nobody ever told you that these lines are drawn the way they are, for example, because of racial voting patterns? No. No one ever told you that they're drawn the way they are because of, quote, natural clustering of Democratic voters, right? No. No one ever told you that they're drawn the way they are because of regional voting patterns? No. Or because of the regional distribution of voters, right? No. No one ever told you they're drawn the way they are to protect communities of interest, right? No. All right. So we talked about districts. To be clear, you also aren't commenting on any of the specific findings that Dr. Cooper made with respect to the county groupings that he analyzed, correct? That's correct. So not on the groupings or any of the districts within those groupings. You're not offering opinions or analysis on that? Correct. All right. So one of the things you say, Dr. Barber, um, in your report, and I think you touched on it today or yesterday as well, um, is that the longer term trends, as you describe them, in the partisan composition of the General Assembly, they are uh, a larger factor in today's partisan composition of the General Assembly than a single round of redistricting. Do I have that right? Uh, yeah, I'm looking at over 50 years of data, and by definition, that's going to span multiple redistricting cycles. Right, and you're saying that these longer trends you're talking about, they are a larger factor than a round of redistricting is in the partisan composition of the General Assembly here. That's, I think, an accurate summary, yes. But you acknowledge that redistricting is a factor in the partisan composition of the North Carolina General Assembly, right? I, yes, I also think that's probably true. Well, not just probably, you think it is true, right? Yeah, it's one of, I think you said it's one of a number of factors. Okay. So yes, that would be true. So redistricting is a factor in the partisan composition of the North Carolina General Assembly that we can observe. Yeah, absolutely. If you drew boundaries in a different way, you'd get different results. So yes, absolutely. Okay. You just aren't offering any opinion on how big a factor that redistricting is in the partisan composition of the General Assembly. Correct. Unlike Dr. Cooper, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know how much, from my understanding of his report, I don't know how much he tries to offer a precise quantification of X proportion of the change we observe is due to redistricting and X proportion is due to some other factor. It's not my understanding that he offers a, a precise number, uh, but I think he offers the opinion that it is a contributing, and I think it may be accurate to say he offers it as a, uh, a large factor in 
uh, the composition of the legislature. You, on the other hand, are not offering an opinion on that. No. And you haven't done any work to determine how large a factor redistricting is in the partisan composition of the General Assembly. Correct. Okay. And you're not providing this court with any way of determining how big a factor redistricting is in the partisan composition of the General Assembly. No, I don't offer any sort of quantification like that in my report. And partisan influence in the redistricting process, that's something that you've never actually tried to study in any of your work, right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Correct that you have never studied that in your work for this yes. case or otherwise? Correct. Okay. And similar, similarly, you're not offering any opinion as to how the trend towards a greater number of Republican seats that you described in that, that graph that we saw um, in the North Carolina General Assembly since the 1970s. You're not offering any opinion about how that compares to similar trends um, of Republicans in state legislatures in, in other southern states, right? No, my report looks just specifically at North Carolina. Right, and you haven't studied North Carolina in relation to any other southern states? No. Okay. So you talked a little bit about this, this graph that you put up um, which I believe was Intervenor Defendant's Exhibit 1, uh, but it, it, it appears in your expert report as well uh, at Plaintiff's Exhibit 1062. Could we put up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1062? And the top there of page 5, I know you said it's difficult to actually see one of the lines on this graph. But you recognize this is a graph that you were talking about earlier, right? Yes. And you were talking about this in the context of these longer term trends that you're, you're describing or observing in the North Carolina General Assembly. Correct. Okay. Um, and I think that you've said in your report that you think that that 2010 election cycle in particular, because of the way you see it on your graph, that's, that's the most notable to you, right? The, I'm not sure what you mean by most notable. Well, you said in your expert report that was the most notable change in the partisan composition of the General Assembly that you were able to observe in your graph. Um, if I, I, I may have said that in my report. I don't recall the specific wording, but okay. I probably, I, if, you, if you say I did, I probably did. Well, for that 2010 election cycle or for any of the election cycles, um, that are included in this chart, you haven't actually done anything to study them beyond just putting the data up in the chart, right? Uh, no, I mean, I produced the chart and then observed the changes from cycle to cycle. So you plunked the numbers in, created the chart, but you haven't looked behind those numbers to analyze any of the specific elections in either chamber of the North Carolina General Assembly that you're talking about in this chart, right? I don't know that I would use the word plunked. I think it takes a little more work to produce these type of <laughs> results. Uh, but uh, no, I did not do any sort of election specific analysis. Okay. Maybe you didn't plunk them in. You did something to put data into this chart and that was about it, right? That is correct. So you didn't look at any of the individual state legislative races in North Carolina um, that, are, that are depicted on this chart, right? That's correct. Or, or at all? Correct. You didn't analyze any of the candidates in any of the state legislative elections that occurred during the time span of this chart? No. Or at all? No. You didn't look at any campaign finance data for the North Carolina General Assembly elections um, for any of the years on this chart, right? That's correct. And when you were conducting your analysis in this case, and you were making observations about this data that you included in the chart, you had never heard of REDMAP, correct? No. The Redistricting Majority Project? No. You didn't know what that was until I made you aware of that at your deposition last month, right? That's correct. And you weren't aware of the specific efforts 
of the Republican State Leadership Committee to influence the 2010 election cycle in particular, right? I wasn't aware of that particular organization. I'm very familiar with the efforts of the parties in various election cycles to maximize their number of candidates. So I think that particular effort by that particular organization in 2010 is a part of a broader effort by Republicans at the time uh, to perform especially well in that election cycle. I also think that in each election cycle, both parties work very hard through a variety of organizations to uh, perform as well as they can. So you're saying that this red map, red map effort was part of this larger effort, but the fact remains you didn't even know what it was when we talked last month, right? No, I wasn't aware of them specifically. You didn't have any knowledge about red map or the efforts of the state, uh, the, the Republican State Leadership Committee in the 2010 election cycle? That's correct. Okay. And you didn't incorporate that, any of those efforts, into your analysis of the opinions that you've offered today? in this case, right? Correct. Okay. Just to make it clear um, what we're talking about, can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1063? Just at the top of this, uh, or towards the middle actually of how the page appears, you can see this is a 2012 red map summary report. Do you see where I'm looking at, Dr. Barber? Yes. And if you skip just slightly Below that, you can see it says how a strategy of targeting state legislative races in 2010 led to a Republican U.S. House majority of 2013. Do you see where I'm reading from? I do, yes. Okay. And this, again, was something you had never heard of before <coughs> last month? I was not aware of Red Map specifically. I am aware of the fact that parties are very cognizant of the fact that redistricting takes place following the decennial census. And I'm very aware that the parties are especially sensitive to the election results that occur around the decennial census. Um, so I think that's a more complete explanation. So again, you're speaking generally, but I'm talking specifically about Red Map and this summary report that I have in front of you didn't have any idea of what that was or that that existed before you performed your analysis. That is correct. Can we go to page two of this exhibit? And you can see there's a heading, um, if we could zoom in, where it says 2010 state elections, red maps execution. Do you see that, Dr. Barber? I do. If you skip to the second paragraph below that, it reads, the rationale was straightforward. Controlling the redistricting process in these states would have the greatest impact on determining how both state legislative and congressional district boundaries would be drawn. Drawing new district lines in states with the most redistricting activity presented the opportunity to solidify conservative policy making at the state level and maintain a Republican stronghold in the U.S. House of Representatives for the next decade. Did I read that correctly? Yes. And if you skip down to the bullet points that are on the same page, below that, the second bullet point from the bottom, you can see committed resources to Colorado and North Carolina, more than $1.2 million. Do you see that? Yes. Again, this was something that you didn't specifically know about or incorporate in, into any of your analysis. That's correct. If we could skip to page four, and towards the bottom, there's another heading that reads the impact do you see where I'm looking at, Dr. Barber? I do, yes. And then below that, you can see newly Republican majorities that they're talking about under the impact section. Do you see that? Yes. And then if you go to the top of the next page, which is already enlarged and, and highlighted on your screen, the top of page five, you can see that the North Carolina House and the North Carolina Senate are listed there under this list of newly Republican majorities. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you weren't aware of any, of any of this when you conducted your analysis or came to the conclusions and came to the conclusions that you've reached and shared with the court, right? I mean, I think REDMAP would like to take credit. And they're, I mean, they're saying there, the impact. I don't know that that's actually the case. But you're correct that I did not 
include uh, a particular analysis of red map into my uh, report. Right, because you didn't know anything about red map. That's correct. Okay. So another thing that you've said is that um, it's difficult to argue, is how you put it in your report, that the redistricting plans implemented by the Republicans after 20, in 2011 and in 2017 have affected the overall partisan composition of the North Carolina General Assembly. Do I have that accurately? I mean, I don't remember exactly how I said it, but I trust that you're accurately reflecting what I said in my deposition. So earlier you said it was one factor, but you're not in a position or you don't think you can argue um, that it actually had, a, had a, affected it in a significant way, right? I think it would be difficult to, as I said, quantify specifically the impact of each of these factors that we're discussing. Dr. Barber, you, it's true though that you've never actually looked for any evidence of the intent of any of the map makers or the map maker in the North Carolina redistricting processes that we're talking about, right? Correct. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 663? We were talking a little bit about the Republican State Leadership Committee before. Um, this is a letter uh, in that 2011 redistricting cycle um, from the Republican late, the State Leadership Committee. Um, and you can see uh, at the top, it's addressed, Dear Legislative Leaders. Do you see what I'm looking at? Yes. And then underneath that, it reads, As you well know, the decennial process of redistricting is underway in most states across the country. Some states have already concluded their redistricting processes, and others have yet to begin. The RSLC continues to play an important role in gaining and keeping Republican majorities around the country. And we are pleased that we now control 56 legislative chambers. Do you see the portion that I read there? Yes. And then if you skip a little bit further down, you can see our redistricting team is led by Tom Hoffler, and it provides an email contact for him. Do you see that? Yes. And that's the Dr. Tom Hoffler that you hadn't heard of um, before, uh, before you were retained in this case. Correct. In fact, you hadn't heard of him until after you'd already conducted your analysis that you've shared with the court in this case. Correct. Okay. So you don't know what Dr. Hoffler's role was in the redistricting process in North Carolina, right? Aside from what I've heard discussed in the last several days, no. So you don't know anything about his role in the redistricting process in 2011 in North Carolina? No. Or in 2017? No. You're, you weren't aware when you came to the conclusions you did in your report that he was the one who actually drew the maps that we're here talking about today, right? That's correct. And you actually said you weren't even interested in studying Dr. Hoffler's role in the redistricting process as part of your analysis in the case, right? I think I did say that, yes. Despite knowing that he was the chief map maker? Correct. Despite knowing that his draft maps of these state legislative districts are in evidence in this case? That's correct. Okay. Direct evidence of partisan intent in redistricting is, is not important to your analysis? Is that what you're saying, Dr. Barber? Well, I think my analysis was not offered to speak to where particular district lines should or should not be drawn. And so in some ways, it's, it's not related to the specific lines that uh, a particular person uh, chose at, at a particular time. So you weren't interested in seeing what was on Dr. Hoffler's hard drive, right? No. Speaking of partisan intent, at your deposition, you told me you weren't even aware of who Representative David Lewis is, right? No, I was not. So you weren't aware of any of Representative Lewis's <coughs> statements about redistricting in North Carolina, right? Correct. Dr. Barber, this case is called Common Cause v. Lewis. You understand that, right? Yes, I do. But I, Dr. Barber, you have acknowledged that Republican state legislatures engaged in gerrymandering after the post-2010 census th that occurred, right? Yes. Objection. By, 
Yeah, I, oh, sorry. You're on my object, too. I don't know what he means by sharing evidence. Over here. Can I finish my statement? Yeah, Dr. Barber, why don't I put the question to you again? Okay. You would say it's true, right, that clearly there was gerrymandering, especially by the Republican controlled legislatures in the 2011 redistricting, correct? So that's a statement from an op-ed that I wrote in the Washington Post. And I think, so what I think you're getting at is not exactly what I meant by that statement. And if you note in the op-ed, I say that gerrymandering is a term that encompasses a number of potential objectives that people draw lines for a variety, draw district lines for a variety of reasons, some of those for partisan reasons, some of those for other reasons that are nonpartisan or may in fact be in, in, in work in opposition to those same objectives. And so I think that the term gerrymandering means a lot of things. It's a very broad term. And under that umbrella, a number of objectives uh, could, be, could be included. But Dr. Barber, you'd agree with me that at least one of the things that gerrymandering means is that partisan influencer aims are uh, predominate or could predominate in a redistricting process. It could be one of a number of factors. Uh, incumbency protection, it could be some sort of agreement between both parties to draw lines in a way that's favorable to both of the parties or agreeable to both of the parties. It could be drawn for a whole host of reasons. Um, and I think that one of those, as you said, could be partisan, but it's one of a basket of uh, reasons or objectives that uh, people could have in the, in, in the process. Dr. Barber, I just want to be clear on this. Are you testifying that when you said gerrymandering in your Washington Post op-ed that you meant it in a good, positive sense? Oh, I don't know that I meant it in a good or a bad way. I simply was observing that there, when people are drawing lines, it's my view that they, of course, have an objective in mind. They're not just randomly putting their pencil on the paper. Um, but those objectives are numerous. There are myriad objectives that a person could be trying to accomplish. Um, and I think a lot of those objectives fall broadly under the umbrella of gerrymandering. All right, Dr. Barber. You testified about Dr. Cooper's conclusions with respect to the political ideology of the North Carolina electorate, right? Correct. And, Dr. Co and you testified about Dr. Cooper's opinion that the North Carolina electorate's political ideology is out of step with the ideology of the North Carolina General Assembly. That was one of the things you testified to? That's correct. But you are not offering any independent measure of the ideological composition of the North Carolina uh, electorate, correct? No, because I think it's an incredibly difficult task that would take uh, a Herculean data collection project and analysis. It would be a very difficult task to so, accomplish. So Dr. Cooper references um, two measures, two sources of data that provide an aggregate measure of a state citizen's, citizenry's ideological leanings. Correct? That's correct. You don't use either one of those. In my report? In your report and the opinions that you've arrived at in this case, you haven't looked at either of those sources that Dr. Cooper used, right? No, I'm, I'm familiar with both of them. But you didn't look at them to come to, an, and come to any conclusion with respect to the actual ideological composition of the North Carolina electorate, right? I, are you asking if I performed a my own analysis? Yes, exactly, Dr. Barber. No, I did not perform any additional analysis with those data because, as I say in my report, I don't believe that those data sets are the proper data to draw the conclusions that we're interested in drawing. And even outside of those data, 
you're not you're not actually saying, are you, that the North Carolina electorate isn't ideologically moderate? I'm saying we just don't have the answer to that question because we don't have the data that we would need to properly answer that question. Okay, so you've done no work on that yourself to try to come to some measure of the ideological composition of the North Carolina citizenry. That's correct. It would have taken um, much more time than uh, the three weeks that I had to produce the report. Dr. Barber, are you, are you telling this court that you don't think that North Carolina voters are moderate on average? I'm saying we don't know. Are you telling this court that North Carolina is not a, a purple state? I'm saying, well, purple is a vague term. Um, I'm saying that you can talk about averages, average ideology, but the averages that we're talking about don't allow us to draw the conclusions that Dr. Cooper wants to draw. So we can certainly say, on average, the electorate appears moderate based on the data that he's looking at. But what I'm then saying is that those averages don't translate to the, um, don't translate to anything about the legislature. They, they just don't, the connection can't be drawn. Let me ask you this. Measuring the ideological composition of a state's electorate, that's something that you have done in your other work in the past, isn't it? Yes. But you chose not to do that in this case. I did not because I think to draw the specific conclusions that Dr. Cooper wants to draw, you need more than averages. And we just don't have those in, these ca in this case. But my question is, for the North Carolina citizenry, you did not do any work to try to determine what the ideological composition of the citizenry is here, despite the fact that you've done that in other work in your academic career. Correct. Dr. Cooper also makes comparisons of the ideological composition of the North Carolina electorate and the ideological composition of the electorate in other states. Are you familiar with what I'm referring to? Yes. Um, you yourself did not do any analysis to draw any comparisons like that, right? No, I don't think that it's especially relevant because we're not talking about redistricting in other states. We're talking about North Carolina. So I think that what the ideological composition of California or Utah looks like is not especially useful in this case. But you didn't do anything to try to measure North Carolina's ideological composition relative to other states at all, right? No. Dr. Cooper talks about this gap between policy preferences in North Carolina, the citizenry's policy preferences, and the policy preferences of the General Assembly. You aren't offering any independent opinion on that gap, right? I'm offering the opinion that we, we can't, with what data is in front of us, draw conclusions about how well or how close or far the gap is between the electorate and the legislature. So you're not saying that that gap that Dr. Cooper testified to doesn't exist, right? I'm not saying it does or that it doesn't. I'm saying we can't, we can't draw conclusions about it from what we have in front of us. You testified about um, measures of ideological policy preferences of citizens and legislatures. That was some of the testimony you've given today, right? That's, yes. Um, you didn't do any specific analysis of any policy issues in North Carolina when you conducted your analysis in this case, right? Correct. Um, and you talked about this hypothetical legislator who might have policy positions that are in step with most of his or her ideological or her constituents, um, but in fact have an ideological score or measure that seems to not reflect that. Do you remember talking about that? In my report? Yeah, I think you talked about it in your report and you referred to it today as well. Uh, yes, so I, I outline a hypothetical scenario um, in my report. I don't 
believe that we necessarily spoke of that hypothetical here in my direct testimony. Okay. We had a different hypothetical state, but in my report there are, is a kind of hypothetical scenario regarding a legislator, and then I have the hypothetical state, and today we just spoke of the state. We didn't talk about that other hypothetical situation. You have, you have a lot of hypotheticals in your report, Dr. Barber, right? Yes, I think they're helpful in illustrating broader points. Right, but you haven't looked at any polling among voters in North Carolina to see what policy issues they care about, right? No. You haven't looked at any other data on North Carolina voters' policy preferences as part of your work in this case, right? Only the data that Dr. Cooper has used. Well, you haven't looked at any polling specific to North Carolina voters um, in any of the, the counties of North Carolina, right? No, as I said, I only used the data that Dr. Cooper used. Okay, and you conducted no analysis, though, of any of those, that, that, the, the policy preference data that Dr. Cooper referred to in his own report? No. So you actually haven't looked at any North Carolina data specifically in relation to this question of whether there are state legislators in North Carolina who appear to be ideologically out of step with their constituents um, and yet are in line with them on a majority of their, their policy positions? You haven't looked at North Carolina data in relation to that question. I don't know that those data exist. In fact, I don't believe that they do. Um, which is why I believe that Dr. Cooper didn't look at that either, because it's just that those data don't exist. So I, again, limited my uh, analysis to the data that Dr. Cooper used. We've, we've been talking about voter preferences. You also have not looked at any issues that the North Carolina General Assembly has voted on as part of your analysis, right? Only the data that Dr. Cooper used. That's the only data that I looked at with regards to the ideological composition of the General Assembly. I want to be clear here. You, didn't, you looked at, but you didn't conduct any analysis of no, any of that No, not beyond data. what Dr. Cooper produced. Okay. So just to be clear, you're not offering any independent opinion about a gap between voter preference in North Carolina and legislators actual ideology here? I'm just offering the opinion that the data that Dr. Cooper uses to draw his opinions is insufficient to draw the opinion that he has reached. As you said, I'm not drawing my own independent opinion as to what that gap, the size of that gap, or the reason for that gap, that sort of thing. And Dr. Barber, at the end of the day, you have not studied North Carolina voters specifically at all in your work in this case, right? Only though the degree to which Dr. Cooper has used that data, as I said, like that's the data that I've looked at. All right, I, I wanna be very clear here. So could we, could we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1060, which was your deposition in this case, and in particular on page 189. And at the top of the page, beginning line one, I asked you, but you haven't investigated North Carolina voters specifically as part of your work in this case. And your answer was? No. We can take Dr. Barber's deposition off. Um, you, talk, you testified today about um, this chart, which I think is, is figure three in your expert report, um, but it shows uh, if we, could, if we could pull up, actually, it might make it easier. Plaintiff's Exhibit 1062 on page 14. So um, at least the left-hand side of what we're looking at here, that's what you talked about earlier in your direct examination. Do you recall that? Yes. The right side is simply the same data, but just zoomed into a portion of the left side uh, figure. Okay. So there's nothing, there's nothing new or different about the right side right. Of, the fig, of the figure. And, and part of what you talked about when you were discussing this chart um, was that it allows you to see those instances where 
a political party in North Carolina, won a minority of the statewide vote in the General Assembly elections, and yet ended up with a majority of seats in one of the General Assembly chambers. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you found that in your analysis that happened seven times in the data that you looked at. Is that right? That's correct. So if we could go actually and zoom in on the bottom of this page, your footnote, where you actually list those seven times. You provide a complete list of instances where this happened, right? Correct. So two of those seven times were in 2018. Do you see that? Yes. Um, when Republicans won a majority of state House seats with a minority of the statewide vote? Yes, that's correct. And Republicans won a majority of state Senate seats with a minority of the statewide vote in 2018, right? That's correct. Four of the other instances there occurred between 2002 and 2010. Is that right? Correct. And these were all instances where the Democrats won a majority of seats in one of the legislative chambers, um, but only a minority of the statewide vote, right? Correct. And for any of these four instances where Democrats won a majority of seats with a minority of the vote, you didn't perform any analysis of whether the district lines might have been drawn in such a way as to benefit the Democrats, the winning Democrats over the Republicans, right? That's correct. You didn't incorporate that into your analysis, right? Correct. Okay. So you... Let's take a, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break now. We'll probably take a short break later on in the morning as well. That's right.
have not been moving in their exhibits as they go, I imagine there's going to be a, a long list, which is presumably going to come sort of at the end of their case today. We sent an email last night asking if we could get that list before so that we would have a chance to, I don't want to get to four forward this afternoon and get presented with, you know, 100 or 150 exhibits um, and have to do an objection on the fly. If we could get a list um, before lunch, that would give us a chance of anything that they're planning to move in before the end of their, their uh, case. That would give us an opportunity to evaluate objections so that we can uh, be efficient to say that. Uh, Your Honor, we, we plan on sending them a list at lunch. We just wanted to make sure that um, Mr. Branch and everyone got through you know, about what they were going to use. Because obviously, we don't want to move in things that we're not using. With so that was our plan, to send you some things. We, we will use the hour and a half at lunch to sort of do it. All right, that sounds like a good arrangement. Thank you. Mr. Sell, further questions for the witness? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. <coughs> and so, Dr. Barber, let's, let's pick back up where we left off before the break. Um, and if we could put back on the screen um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1062, which is your expert report in this case, and particularly page 14, footnote 11. And I was asking you about this in relation to the opinion you testified to on your direct examination that instances where a party has won a majority of seats in one of the chambers of the North Carolina General Assembly with a minority of votes, um, I think you said it was something like not as rare as you might expect. Do you recall that? Yes. And so we talked about the first two on your complete list here are the 2018 House and Senate elections in North Carolina, right? Correct. Where Republicans won the majority of seats with a minority of votes. Correct. And then I directed your attention to the next four on your list here, which occurred between 2002 and 2006. Do you see those? Yes. And those are instances where the Democrats won a majority of seats in one of the legislative chambers um, with a minority of the statewide vote, right? Correct. And those elections occurred, those elections 2002 to 2006, those elections occurred under district maps drawn by the Democrats, right? I believe so. I believe, and I'm, I'm not certain of the specifics. I think at some point in there, there was a court drawn map as well, but broadly, I think the decade it was under maps drawn by the Democratic Party. Broadly, that decade, the maps that were in place um, those were enacted uh, through the Democratic control, or with the, they were enacted by the Democrats in the General Assembly. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, but for any of these instances that we're talking about here, where a Demo Democrats won a majority of seats in a legislative chamber with a minority of the state statewide vote, you didn't perform any analysis of whether the district lines that the Democrats drew might have been drawn in such a way as to benefit them at the expense of the Republicans. Is that right? That's correct. All right. So those instances you have up on your, and, and this footnote 11 here, um, those could have been because the Democrats did a good job of gerrymandering the maps that were in place during those elections, right? That's very possible. You can't tell us one way or the other. Correct. Because you didn't incorporate that into your analysis at all. That is correct. Um, Dr. Barber, I want to move on to a related topic that you testified to or about today. Um, and could we pull up Intervenor Defendants Exhibit 23? In particular, if we could go, actually go to page two of this exhibit. And Dr. Barber, during your direct examination, do you recall talking about this exhibit? Yes. And this was a chart um, that you created to show what you say is the historical difference between seat shares and vote shares in the North Carolina General Assembly elections from 1994 through 2018, correct? Correct. Um, this was something um, that you brought to your deposition in this case, right? Correct. It was not part of your original expert report. The particular numbers are used 
to produce the figure that we were just looking at, but the chart itself was not a part of my report. This chart, nor the charts or graph on any of the four pages of this exhibit, that wasn't something that you included in your original expert report, right? That's correct. You showed that to us at the first for the first time at your deposition? That's correct. Okay. So, so I want to stay on, on this page. Um, this includes, as you said, the, ap the, the average absolute, or I'm sorry, the absolute difference between the seat share that Republicans won and the statewide vote share that they won for all of these elections from 1994 through 2018, right? Correct. So that includes elections after the 2011 redistricting, right? Correct. Okay. And you're, you're, you were sharing with us, this court, your opinion that this tells you something about the translation of seats to votes, right? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, focusing on this page, if you look at the year 2012 and that particular row, that was the election that occurred after, that occurred after the 2011 redistricting, correct? Yes. And if you look at that, you see that according to your measure, that absolute difference, that's actually the largest of any of the elections that you include on your chart for the North Carolina State House. Is that right? Yes. It's a 12.577 difference between the statewide vote share that Republicans won in the General Assembly elections and the, Repub and the seat share that they won in the North Carolina House elections, right? That's correct. Okay. That's the largest in the House side, right? Yes. Um, and that's a, a jump up from the year before, before the Republicans redrew the maps, when the percentage in 2010 in the North Carolina State House was only 3.374%, right? Correct. All right. And if you go I, to... The, sorry. I should just note that we're looking at the absolute difference. The column to the left shows the difference, which I... I think it's important to note that the sign is different from 2010 to 2012. So there was a seat to vote negative difference in 2010 and a positive difference in 2012. But you're absolutely correct that the absolute difference is three and in the following year is 12. Right, and just to sort of clarify what you're saying, the difference column, which is to the left of the absolute difference column, that has either a negative or positive value? That's correct. So the negative values are indicating when the Democrats actually won a greater percentage of seats in the North Carolina House than they did the vote share. Exactly. And the positive values are the, when the Republicans won a greater number of seats than they did the vote share in the North Carolina House. That's exactly right. Okay, and you can see it swings from negative 3.374% indicating that the Democrats won more seats than they did the percentage of the vote, correct? Correct. To a positive 12.5%. Seven, I'm sorry, is it a five, seven, seven percent? Of correct, the, that's okay. correct. The largest deviation, absolute difference, I should say, of any of the elections that you include on your North Carolina House chart. Yes. And if you go to the Senate side in 2012, um, you can see that the, the absolute difference for, for, that, for that year's elections in the North Carolina Senate is 13.21 percent, right? That's correct. So even greater than on the House side for that particular year, right? Correct. And that's a jump up from the 2010 elections when it was 2.815%, right? Correct. Okay. I know you didn't, um, I don't think you actually showed this to everyone in, in court today, but there's a fourth page of this exhibit. Um, if we could go to that, page four of uh, intervener defendants exhibit 23 um, and this is something you talked about uh, at your deposition you recall yes um, I know you didn't share this analysis that you did with the court though today right no not today okay um, but it factors into what your conclusion in, is with regard to the translations of seats to votes in North Carolina General Assembly elections it's just simply the average of the column that we've been talking about. Right. So on the left-hand side here, you have a column that is the average absolute deviation between vote share and seat share. 
and that is showing the average absolute deviation for all of those elections from 1994 to 2018 for both the House and the Senate. Is that correct? That's correct. So you've changed the numbers a little bit here because they're not in percentages, right? Uh, I, I think that they're just lacking the percent sign, but the numbers themselves, I think, are this would be the average, just the average of those columns. Right. Right. Well, we were just looking at. Oh, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. Yes, these are these are not the the numbers on the previous table have been multiplied by 100 to reflect percentage points, and so these numbers um, have not simply been multiplied by 100. Right, because we were just looking at 2012 in the North Carolina right. House, right? That's correct, yes. And that had a 12.577% right. deviation. So the interpretation here would be a 0 0.10 would be a 10 percentage point. Okay, and you've also rounded these a little bit, yeah, right? Yeah, there's a little bit of rounding involved. As okay, well. all right. But so on the left-hand side, you've taken that column that was labeled absolute difference from the chart we were just looking at on page two of Inter Intervenors Defendant Exhibit 23, and you've averaged that across all of the elections, 1994 to 2018. That's correct. On the right-hand side, you've taken the average absolute deviation, but just, pri just for elections prior to 2012, right? That's correct. And that's because those elections occurred before the 2011 redistricting when Republicans drew the maps, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and this... Relate, this relates to your opinion that there's actually, from the pre-period to the overall period, um, not a significant difference, right? Uh, I, I think it's just to point out, I, because we're talking about the districting period of the last decade, I think it's simply to point out what happens if we look at the period not in question. Um, and so that's, as you said, why 2012 would be the relevant cut point. What you don't do here is you don't actually show us the average absolute deviation for just the pre-2011 redistricting period and just the post-2011 redistricting period, right? Oh, n no, you could easily calculate it and, and sure. you could look at it, yes, absolutely. Right. You didn't do that as part of this exhibit though, right? Uh, no, it's not on this table here. Okay, so just quickly, um, let's put up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1065. And this is a chart that actually does calculate that. So, so Dr. Barber, this shows you that in the 1994 to 2010 period, the average absolute deviation in the House and in the Senate are in that left column, right? Correct. And you said that there were some differences because of your rounding, but these numbers are, the, are based on the same data that you included in your chart we were just looking at a moment ago, right? That's correct. So just for the pre-2011 redistricting period, you can see that the percentage deviation in the House is 4.03. Do you see that? Yes. And the percentage difference in the Senate is 9.66? Yes. But after the 2011 redistricting, with the Republican-drawn maps, you can see that both of those numbers increase, right? Correct. They go up, in the House case, uh, over, over double what the average absolute deviation was, right? That's correct. And in the Senate, they go up as well. That is also correct. So as a measure of seats to votes that you included in your original exhibit here, if you conduct this pre and post 2011 redistricting analysis, it actually shows you that it was, a, it was a, less, or a less efficient translation of, of seats to votes, right? In the post 2011 period? Compared to the pre 2011 period when Republicans had not drawn the maps, right? That is. Correct, yes. It, yeah, that's right, yes. Okay. Um, but you never actually calculated any of this when you were conducting your analysis in the case, right? Well, I, I calculated the left column because that left column appears in my table, but the right column is, is new, that's correct. Right, today is the first time you're seeing the right column. That's correct. The actual comparison pre and post. Correct. Okay. So. I want to move on to the next topic that you testified about during your direct examination. Um, and that was sort of the geographic distribution of voters in North Carolina. Do you recall that part of your testimony? Yes, I do. Okay. 
Um, and you talked about your conclusion that Democratic voters in North Carolina live in areas that are more densely populated, right? On average, yes. Okay. And you think that this might have an impact on the partisan outcomes of North Carolina's state legislative elections, right? Correct. Um, you're aware that under North Carolina law, redistricting for de General Assembly districts is done within groupings of counties, right? Correct. The lines are drawn for districts within those county groupings. Yes. And counties are grouped together based um, on population size. That's my understanding, yes. Some of these groupings have just one county, right? I believe so. With districts all drawn within that one county. That's my understanding, yes. Other groupings have more than one county. Yes. With distri districts drawn within those multiple counties. Yes. Okay. But you have not researched any specific North Carolina counties as part of your analysis of the geographic distribution of North Carolina voters, right? That's correct. My analysis looks at the statewide relationship. Okay. You haven't looked at any of the individual county groupings that these districts are actually drawn within, right? <coughs> correct. And you haven't specifically analyzed any of the district, or I'm sorry, the county groupings that Dr. Cooper spent some time in his report and in his testimony before this court analyzing and providing opinions on, right? Correct. Or any of the specific districts within those county groupings that Dr. That Dr. Cooper talked about, right? Correct. Okay. Can we pull up quickly Plaintiff's Exhibit 1062? And this is your expert report, and if we could go to page 20, which contains figure six. And Dr. Barber, this is actually the expert report that we talked about at your deposition, if you, do you recall that? Yes. Okay. And this is that, this is a version of the figure you were talking about during a direct examination. Um, your map that shows the partisan lean of VTDs shaded in blue? Yes. Right? Yes. Okay, and so there are some very democratic leaning VTDs that are sort of in the Charlotte area. Do you see those? I do, yes. And some in the Raleigh sort of university, university triangle area even? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and those yellow highlights that we can kind of make out, um, those are where you sort of tried to draw what you considered the Raleigh and Charlotte areas back at your deposition, right? Uh, yeah, I think we were doing a little geography quiz. Right, and you had a little trouble finding those circled, at the time. Circled those areas in hi the highlighter there. Right. Um, and you eventually got there and, and, and circled what you thought to be those locations, right? Those, the circles are there. And you, you're, you're a political scientist, I understand. Is, I right? am, yes. You are not an expert in North Carolina's political geography. Uh, I mean, I study political geography. My, I, I don't specify it for special. Oh, sorry, there was a. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I thought I heard an objection. <laughs> My, my question for you, Dr. Barber, is you are not an expert in North Carolina's political geography, right? No, it's not a okay. specific research focus of mine. Okay, not an expert in it. I think that's accurate. So we can see the Democratic-leaning VTDs in the two areas that you've circled here, the Charlotte area and the Raleigh area. But fair to say, there's a lot of other Democratic-leaning VTDs in other parts of the state, right? That's absolutely the case. My analysis was to point out that the average relationship, uh, of course, averages, there's noise around averages. But my question for you, Dr. Barber, is you didn't actually analyze how any of these Democratic leaning VD, VTDs, or really any of the VTDs, fit into the county groupings for North Carolina's state legislative districts, right? That's correct. So all of Dr. Cooper's analysis that he shared with the court, walking through county grouping by county grouping and discussing the district lines and their partisan impacts, that's not something that you've analyzed as part of your work in this case. Correct. As I said earlier, it was not my intention to talk about where particular district boundaries should or should not be drawn. Um, and I didn't do that here. You're not commenting on any of that? That's correct. Okay. 
So in other words, you haven't done any analysis to um, rebut some of the opinions we've heard in this case that the Republican state, the legislature here, gerrymandered within large counties in North Carolina, right? No, I'm not speaking, as you said, to particular counties or county groupings uh, in the redistricting plan. You haven't done any analysis to rebut any of the opinions we heard, for example, about how the legislature gerrymandered districts within Wake County. Correct. Or in Mecklenburg County. Correct. Or in Cumberland County. Correct. Or in Forsyth County. Correct. You haven't done any analysis of how those county groupings were gerrymandered, um, or other, as other expert, experts have testified to, how the districts within those counties could have been gerrymandered to favor the Republicans, right? Uh, as I said, I've not done any county grouping analysis. Okay. Um, and, and I don't want to belabor the point, but Dr. Barber, you're not presenting any analysis today to rebut the, some of the expert opinions that we also heard that these plans, these district lines, these state legislative maps in North Carolina are actually the most gerrymandered plans possible to favor Republicans within the confines of the county groupings rule that you discussed. Correct. So in your report to, and in your testimony today, you brought up an article from 2013 authored by Dr. Joey Chen and by Dr. Jonathan Rodin. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and you, you said that sort of was um, one of the important starting points for you in that section of your report that you testified about today, right? Correct. That paper that we looked at, that was a paper that related to the congressional districting within Florida. Is that right? Um, I believe that the paper spends most of its time focused on Florida. There are some other analyses of other states. North Carolina, as I said, was not one of them in the paper. But it's, it's not the case that that paper is exclusive to Florida. The bulk of the paper is about Florida's congressional districts, though, right? The simulations that they do um, are specific to Florida, but there are other analyses in there of other states. And none of those analyses or data that the paper talks about are of or concern North Carolina? No, as I said, that was, if they had done it, then there wouldn't have been a need for me to do it. Uh, the point of them not including North Carolina was that that then leaves open the question of whether North Carolina adheres to the patterns that that they observe in their paper. Well, it's funny, I hear you say if they had done it. You're aware that Dr. Chen testified in this case that he had done it, right? I'm aware that he testified in this case. I don't think he did exactly the same things that he did in that paper. Uh, there are simulations in that paper. He presented some simulations here. I don't know if they're the same. I, as you said, the simulations in that paper are from congressional districts. Uh, but then there are other n not simulation uh, analyses and patterns that they observe in that paper as well. Let's just be clear though, Dr. Barber, you did not create or analyze any simulations, any simulated maps as part of your work in this case. No, I did not. And I know that you said you haven't actually reviewed Dr. Chen's expert report in this case, but are you aware that he has done that? I'm aware that he presented simulations here, yes. Okay. Are you aware that he's come to conclusions, op the opposite conclusions that you have in this case? Uh, I'm not aware of his exact conclusions, uh, but I'll take your word for it. You agree, though, that Dr. Chen is one of the foremost political science scholars on the question of political geography, right? That's why you reference his paper? He's, yes, he's very well known. Okay. And he actually did, as, as you're aware now, create simulated maps and analyze them, right? Yes, I'm aware of that. And unlike Dr. Chen, just to be clear, you're not offering any method or measure for the court to determine whether the geographic distribution of voters within North Carolina could lead to the districting maps that have the type, the partisan lean that we see in this case, right? Correct. Okay. You're not, you're, you're not offering any method for determining that um, in the way that Dr. Mattingly did, right? 
Um, I, I would imagine the answer is no. However, I'm not aware of the analysis and specific method by which Dr. Mattingly arrives at his opinions. And I guess the answer is the same for Dr. Pagden as well, right? That's correct. Okay. So if their methodologies did account for any natural geographic clustering of voters um, in analyzing these district plans, your analysis in this case does not do that, right? I, I'm not, I don't know the ins and outs of how their analysis works, so I, I really can't speak to what they've done. Okay, so you are not rebutting the opinion that Dr. Chen testified to in this case, that political geography does not explain the partisan bias of these maps, right? I'm, I have no opinion on Dr. Chen's testimony in this particular case. You're not offering an opinion on that conclusion he came to? Uh, on Dr. Chen, no. Okay. We've been talking about Dr. Chen's conclusion, um, but that paper that from 2013 that you referenced, that's also co-authored by Dr. Jonathan Rodin, right? That's correct. And Dr. Rodin, he's another, uh, would you say, respected political scientist? Yes. You've cited to Dr. Rodin's work before, right? I have. Okay. Mostly to his work in survey research. Dr. Rodin has also come to a different conclusion than you have regarding the impact of the um, geographic clustering of North Carolina's voters. Are you aware of that? Um, I'm not sure exactly where we're, what we're talking about. I sure. Don't, he's not involved in this case, as, as, if, if I'm correct. He's not an expert in this case who's testified before the court, Dr. Barber, but you said that he, his article is um, part of the starting point for you in, in some of your analysis you did, right? That's correct. And you're, you're not aware then that he's actually um, looked at this question of the geographic distribution of voters in North Carolina? Uh, I, I think you're directing us to a book that he's recently published, but I'm not exactly sure. So you're aware that Dr. Roden actually did publish a book recently. Um, that's not something you looked at as part of your expert report, right? No, it wasn't published at the time that I wrote my report. Okay. And could we just pull up um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1066, and particularly, and, and this looks, this is Dr. Roden's book, right? Looks like it, or All right. it looks like the title page of it. And I, I just want to go to page, page two of the exhibit, page 173 of the book. Yes, Your Honor. So, so, Dr. Barber, now we've got it up on the screen. The particular section of Dr. Roden's book um, where he says something about North Carolina, right? Uh, it looks like it, yes. And in this section, he writes, North Carolina is an especially striking case. The nonpartisan simulations did not lead to any asymmetric packing of Democrats. Due to the presence of a sprawling knowledge economy corridor, a series of smaller automobile cities with relatively low partisan gradients, and the distribution of rural African Americans, Democrats are relatively efficiently distributed in North Carolina at the scale of congressional districts. Did I read that correctly? You did, yes. Okay. And that's not something that you, that you took into account at all in your analysis, right? I mean, I have no idea what he's done in this book. It, it wasn't available at the time that I authored my report. I also, he refers to nonpartisan simulations. I have no idea what those are, how he's done them, what variables he's included, how he's run the analysis. 
I have no idea what he's talking about when he talks about particular geographic features of the state. Um, he mentions that he's talking about the efficient distribution of voters at the scale of congressional districts. I did my analysis at the VTD level and the county level. I mean, I, have, I just can't draw any conclusions from a snippet of a book that was published less than a month ago. Okay, but just to be clear, Dr. Chen and Dr. Rodin's article from 2013 was a starting point for your analysis, right? Yes, that's correct. And we've, we've heard a little bit about Dr. Chen's analysis and conclusions, which are different than yours, right? That's correct. Regarding North Carolina. That's correct. And now we see Dr. Rodin, the, his co-author, also different conclusions than yours, correct? I mean, I don't know how he came to those conclusions. So Dr. Barber, you talked a little bit yesterday and today about your responsibilities um, as an assistant professor, right? Yes. And you teach students at BYU about American democracy? That's correct. You teach an American politics seminar to undergraduates, right? I do, yes. And you teach graduate level courses concerning US politics as well, right? No, I don't. BYU only, our department is an undergraduate focused department. We don't have a graduate program at BYU. I, I understand, I misunderstood. But you do teach your, your students, your undergraduate students, about American democracy and American politics? Yes, that's correct. And you've been giving testimony today, in this case, as an expert in American political science, right? Yes, that's correct. So Dr. Barber, you understand that legislatures in the United States used to dilute people's votes by dr drawing districts with unequal populations, right? Yes. And that was bad for American democracy, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. And then eventually, the courts prohibited that practice of drawing districts with unequal populations, right? That's correct. And that was good for American democracy, wasn't it? I tend to think so, yes. Dr. Barber, you understand that legislatures used to freely engage in racial gerrymandering too, correct? Used to, and I think there are cases where it still occurs. And they, they used to, and in some cases maybe still, sort out African American voters um, into particular districts to dilute their votes, right? I think that's been the case, yes. To dilute their votes based on race? Uh, yes. And that was bad for American democracy too, right? Uh, yes, I believe that is the case, yes. And eventually the courts prohibited that practice of racial gerrymandering, right? Yes. And that was, good for, that yes. was good for American democracy, wasn't it? I believe so, yes. So, Dr. Barber, you understand that today, legislatures sometimes engage in partisan gerrymandering, right? Uh, at times, it's possible, yes. They sort Democratic voters into particular districts to create an advantage for Republicans, for example, right? It's possible. Well, it's something that, that you're aware of, you've written yeah, about. I'm aware of it, yes. And it can go the other way. It can go the other way in terms of parties drawing the district lines too, right? Yes. So if one of your students, for example, in your American politics seminar, came to you and asked you whether the practice of partisan gerrymandering was good for American democracy, you would tell them that it's not, right? I would tell them that it's incredibly complicated and that there are a number of factors that would need to happen uh, to draw conclusions about that statement. But you wouldn't teach your students that partisan gerrymandering is good for American democracy, would you? I would teach my students to draw inferences based on the rigorous analysis of data and that they should develop hypotheses to test those, uh, they should develop hypotheses and then test those hypotheses using the scientific method. That's what I would teach my students. Let's say an eight-year-old asked you this question. 
okay. whether partisan gerrymandering is good for American democracy. John, I'd like to object on the grounds that we had a, uh, one of our lawyers asked a witness about the term cracking and packing, and the court sustained the objection because it called for a legal conclusion. This is the exact same situation here. The council's not defining what he means by partisan gerrymandering. He's starting to get, trying to get a nice sound bite here. This calls for a legal conclusion. And without defining what he's talking about, this witness should not be uh, permitted to answer that question. Your Honor, I'm not asking for a legal conclusion. Dr. Barber has testified really at length about the courses he teach in American government and American democracy. And, I, and he's also talked about his own definition of gerrymandering, and he's talked about partisan gerrymandering. I'm asking him his, his opinion on this question, not a legal question. Uh, overruled. Uh, we'll allow the question. He can explain his answer, define his terms if he chooses to. Okay, so, so Dr. Barber, you were talking about looking at hypotheses, studying data, the types of things that you, will, you would talk to with your undergraduate political science students about, right? That's correct. But, but let's say an eight-year-old asks you, okay. is partisan gerrymandering, is that practice good for American democracy? You wouldn't tell them that that's good for American democracy, would you? I mean, I think this is a ridiculous question. Uh, I doubt an eight-year-old would know what we're even talking about, first of all. I don't interact with a lot of eight-year-olds, so I'm not sure about their level of political information, um, I would probably tell the eight-year-old that there's interesting research in political science that they should read to assess these conclusions, and that when they're grown up, they should take my class. <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk more about it in class. Thank you, Dr. Barber. I have no further questions. Cross-examination by, let's see, legislative defendants. Any questions, State. Mr. Branch, redirect. A few more questions, although, Your Honor, it would be a little easier if I do it here. If I speak up, would that be okay with support? Uh, for it's important that the witness and the court reporter hear you, so if you do speak up, that's fine. Uh, we'll let you know if you can't hear you. <laughs> passage from a book and then ask you a question about it. Uh, it is puzzling that there are so many purple and even blue states like Pennsylvania where citizens routinely elect Democratic senators, governors, and attorneys general, but where Democrats have had little chance of winning a majority of the congressional delegation or state legislature. For many frustrated Democrats, the explanation is simple, partisan gerrymandering. Republicans gained control of many state legislatures in time for the most recent round of redistricting in the early 2010s, then drew odd-shaped boundaries that packed as many Democrats as possible into a handful of districts that they easily won, leaving the remaining districts with Republican majorities. Armed with a sophisticated geos geospatial software and a large budget, Republican operatives carefully drew maps and distributed Republicans as efficiently as possible across districts so as to win the maximum number of seats. There may be, there's much truth to this widely accepted account, but it provides an oversimplified and ultimately misleading answer to a complex question. Why cities lose demonstrates that the Democrats' problem with votes and seats goes much deeper and is far more intricate than the impact of a handful of political operatives in a room with a computer. Without a doubt, gerrymandering makes sense. Objection, Your Honor. I'm sorry, we've been reading a couple pages I've at least of a book. The, the, the opposing counsel just seems to be testifying now by reading this book, for uh, the record. I did not have a copy of the book that uh, counsel asked Dr. Barber about in his cross examination. I'm simply reading, Your Honor, what I would like to do is read this passage out to the witness and ask him if he is similarly unable to offer an opinion on it, as he was unable to offer an opinion on the passage previously questioned by uh, counsel for plaintiffs. All right, so I guess it would help if we knew who the author of this <laughs> was. This is uh, the, a passage from the same book, Why Cities Lose, by Dr. Roden, that 
counsel previously previously asked Dr. Barber about. Are you introducing this for substantive purposes? Uh, I'm not introducing it for substantive purposes. I'm introducing it to contrast it with the impeachment material that um, Mr. Sella previously questioned Dr. Barber about. And your, your Honor, I don't understand. Are they impeaching their own witness with this book right now? I don't. I don't understand the purpose of this then. Go ahead and finish the passage, and I think that we'll hear what your question is, follow-up question about determining whether it's an impeachment question, or a corroboration question, or a substantive purposes. Thank you, Your Honor. Without a doubt, gerrymandering makes things worse for the Democrats, but their underlying problem can be summed up with the old real estate maxim, location, location, location. Now, Dr. Barber, similar to the question that Mr. Sella asked you about why cities lose earlier, you can likewise not offer an opinion about whether or not Mr. Roden's statement that I just read to you is accurate because you likewise have not been able to measure anything about the analysis that he uses. Is that right? That's correct. I haven't read the book. It's only been available for a few weeks. Thank you. Now you were asked a number of questions about how deeply you analyze North Carolina elections by Mr. Sella. Uh, you reviewed all of the backup materials cited by Dr. Cooper in his expert report. Is that right? Correct. And did Dr. Cooper perform detailed election analyses of a number of North Carolina elections in his report? He talks about the 2018 election um, and a few other prior elections in his report. What, uh, what data did Dr. Cooper use to come to his conclusions about the ideology of North Carolina's electorate in the North Carolina legislature in his report. So the data for his study of the leg or I'm sorry, of the electorate, as I mentioned earlier, come from the Barry et al. study uh, and from the Warshaw and Tosanovich study. Uh, his conclusions about the state legislature come from uh, data from Shore and McCarty, which is a database of state legislative ideology scores for the entire country, um, and then uh, some election results for the state legislature as well. Now changing subjects, are North Carolina General Assembly members elected by district? Yes. And did Dr. Cooper do any studies about whether the individual representatives or senators in the North Carolina General Assembly are out of touch with the constituents in their specific districts? No. So his, the data he cited was aggregated statewide data. Is that fair? That is correct. And do you think it would be important to have district level ideological measures of voters in order to accurately determine whether legislators match the ideological preferences of voters in their respective districts? I do, as I said in my earlier testimony, it would be essential to know the issue positions of voters and how those, uh, district by district, so that you could then see how legislators are voting on the preferences of their constituents in their district. Thank you. Uh, can you please turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 1063? This is the red map summary report that was printed out. And you were asked about both your deposition and earlier by Mr. Sella. Um, I'm not sure exactly where it is in this. Towards the back. This is tab 1063. Oh. of January 2013, uh, December 21st, 2010, 
17th of November 2010, 16th of November 2010. I think that's all of them. So it would appear that the range of posts in exhibit 10, plaintiff's exhibit 1063 is from 2010 to 2013? Correct. And what were you doing during that period of time? Uh, I was in graduate school. And you were asked about um, the impact of red map during the 2010 election cycle during your deposition, weren't you? Correct. And to be clear for the court, you were qualified as an expert witness on campaign finance questions <coughs> in the Florida case, federal, the Florida federal case in which you testified last week. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And do you recall being asked about the impact of red map during the 2010 election cycle and specifically being directed to page four of exhibit 1063, about three quarters of the way down at um, number seven. Objection, Your Honor. The question's about his testimony in another case about it. Uh, this is a question about the deposition that you took of him. Oh, I apologize, Your Honor. I thought that it was about the case last week. That you no, mentioned. this is a question from about a question Mr. Sella asked him at his June 14, 2019 deposition. Go ahead, Mr. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to reorient ourselves, uh, if you can look at page four of exhibit 1063, there's a line item here down at number seven. Um, do you recall Mr. Sella asking you about the impact of red map during the 2010 election cycle and pointing you to the line item where it says committed resources to Colorado more than $550,000 to North Carolina more than $1.2 million. Yes, I do. What was the number one? I apologize. The last one. Uh, committed resources to Colorado more than $550,000. North Carolina more than $1.2 million. And do you recall Mr. Sella asking you about that? Yes. And can you describe to the court what your answer was to that question? Uh, I believe that my answer was, it's certainly in the interests of RedMap to claim that their efforts were wildly successful uh, because they can then raise money to do what they are doing. Uh, however, studying campaign finance, it's my view that Organizations after, often dramatically overstate the impact that their particular contribution has on any particular election or election cycle. Uh, academic studies of campaign finance suggest that the relationship between spending and election results is significantly more nuanced uh, and that there are a number of other uh, competing factors uh, regarding the, the impact that spending in an election may have on the outcome of those election results. All right. Um, did the fact that you didn't know about REDMAP or about Dr. Hoffler prior to being retained as an expert in this case impact your analysis of Dr. Cooper's report? No, it did not. So it did not affect, for example, the GIS information or the information from the North Carolina voter file that you used to analyze Dr. Cooper's report? No. Um, finally, Mr. Sella described, uh, asked you if you thought North Carolina was a purple state. Uh, given your expertise in partisanship and ideology, is your analysis of voters and legislators' ideology more complicated than attempting to assign a color to a state? Uh, that's definitely the case. No further questions. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Thank you. Uh, we will take a five minute recess. Uh, we will keep it five minutes. So we'll just have five minutes to uh, work on it. Very close to the five minutes.
for evidence for the court report. Court report. We just need to wait for our court report before we get underway. Okay. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We'll uh, ask of the defendants, is there further evidence? Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, Nate Pencook from Shanahan Law Group on behalf of the intervener defendants. Intervener, intervener defendants call Ben York to the stand. <coughs> My first question. I, I appreciate you being here this morning, Mr. York. Um, now, could you tell the court what you do for a living? Yes, I'm the town clerk for the village of Alamance. And how long have you had that job? 11 years. And in that job, um, are you required to gain knowledge of the community of Alamance and the surrounding areas? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I do a variety of things like uh, uh, permits and budgeting and receive water bills in the office, and I also uh, leave the office quite frequently and, and uh, am out in the community. And have you done any other work for any other municipalities in Alamance County? Yes, I've done some uh, planning and zoning work for the town of Ossipee and um, assisted the town of Swepsonville uh, in some matters as well. And where do you live? I live in Burlington, North Carolina. And can you state your address for the record? Yes, 1720 Old St. Mark's Church Road. Apartment 71E, Burlington, North Carolina, 27215. Um, approximately how long have you lived at that address? 11 years. And why did you move there? I moved there when I took my current job. Okay. Um, you also went to school in Alamance, is that right? Oh, that's correct. I, got, I did my um, undergraduate work at Elon, uh, went there from 2000 to 2004, and graduated in 2004. Um, and why did you decide to remain in Alamance County thereafter? Um, I, I actually left Alamance County to go to graduate school at, at App State between, um, I went home for a year and then I went to App State for a couple of years, came back to Alamance County in 08 when I accepted my current job. But um, I love Alamance County, it's a great place. Um, it's just, it's, they're wonderful people. There's in some ways, the feeling is, is similar to uh, Stanley County where I'm from. Um, and do you intend to live there through 2020? I do. Now, uh, switching gears a little bit, when did you first register to vote in North Carolina? In December of 99. And have you been registered as a Republican the entire time? Yes. Um, have you voted in every North Carolina General Assembly race since the time that you registered? Yes. And have you voted for the Republican candidate every time? Yes. And do you intend to do so again in 2020? Yes. Um, do you have a preference for the General Assembly to be the majority of any one party or another? Yes, I have a preference for it to be Republican. And what sorts of policies are important for you, um, for the Republican majority in the legislature to enact? Uh, the most important policies to me are, are fiscal in nature, a, a good budget, lower taxes. Um, are you active in politics? I am. I am the chairman of the Alamance County Republican Party. I have been so since... Uh, 2015. 
Um, I am also the uh, I'm also on the sixth district executive committee, and I've served on there since 2013. Um, and that also puts me on the state executive committee. I'm also on the rules committee for the state convention. Okay. Um, now, as chairman of the Alamance County Republican Party, what sorts of things do you do? Uh, what um, uh, what a lot of political parties do. We uh, raise money. We uh, help to recruit candidates for office. Um, make sure our precincts are organized for th throughout the year and especially on election day. Okay. And that's something that you do countywide, right? Yes. Um, can you describe the Alamance County Republican Party's activities in the 2018 State House and State Senate races? Yes, uh, there was a phone calling and, and door knocking, um, certainly trying to make sure that each precinct had someone uh, there to staff it on Election Day to hand out materials. Um, you know, there was a lot of effort put in in that, in that race. Okay. Um, and are you familiar with the makeup and boundaries of House District 63? Yes. Okay, um, if we could pull up Intervenor Defendant's <coughs> Trial Exhibit 25 for demonstrative purposes, and Your Honors, if um, my colleague could uh, approach with some exhibits. Yes. I'll just note for the record that the copy that's well, never mind, it's been corrected. Um, <clears throat> Mr. York, can you generally describe House District 63? Yes, it's the, uh, uh, comes from the uh, eastern end of, of Alamance County and um, contains uh, most of the um, uh, municipalities in Alamance County, keeps them, actually they're all whole in this particular map with the exception of of Burlington, which is split, which generally as large as it is, it's going to be split. And there's one small piece of the municipality of Hall River that happens to be in the um, Fawcett Precinct, which is. Uh, you know, can you speak up? I'm not sure. Sure. Thank you. Excuse me. Yeah, so um, uh, District 63 comes from the east, uh, eastern end of Alamance County. It contains several of the municipalities in Alamance County Swepsonville, Hall River, Green Level, Graham and Mebane, and they're all whole in, these particular, uh, in this particular map, with the exception of Hall River, which has uh, uh, got one portion in 05, which is sort of that middle precinct uh, at the sort of top there. Um, and I think that just happens to cross over into that precinct. And then, of course, the city of Burlington, which is split. Now, uh, can you describe what you witnessed in the uh, 2018 elections in the House District 63 race as the Alamance County Republican Party chair? Yes, there was a lot of uh, interest and a lot of activity in that race from both the Republican parties and the Democratic Party um, at both the uh, uh, local level and at the um, and from the state. Um, uh, Steve Ross, who was the representative for that district, worked very hard on that race, I think harder than I've seen him work on any other race. Not that he doesn't normally work hard on his races, but um, uh, I think there was a, a general feeling of, of this was going to be a, a close race. Okay. And who was the Democratic challenger in that race? I'll try to move the chair here so I can get a little closer to the microphone. Um, I'm sorry. Who was the Democratic challenger in that race? Erica McAdoo. Um, in your experience, did you think that Ms. McAdoo was a formidable opponent for Representative Ross? Not really, no. Okay. Can you explain why? Uh, I don't think that her politics generally line up with the rest of, of Alamance County. Um, and uh, she also just, she did some things that, uh, for example, she had a, a questionnaire that she received from the NRA. And um, a, a lot of groups will send out questionnaires um, uh, for candidates to fill out. And those groups receive those questionnaires back and then decide whether they want to endorse those candidates. And Ms. McAdoo um, decided not to fill her form out. Instead, tore it up, and I mean, it was filmed, and she posted it on social media. I don't think that kind of thing really plays very well in Alamance County. Okay. Um, now, do you recall who won House District 63 in 2018? Yes, uh, Steve Ross. Okay. Was it a close election? It was. It was decided by less than one percent of the vote, or right right at one percent of the vote, which is 
uh, right around 300 uh, votes. Um, and do you believe that House District 63 will again be, com uh, be close in 2020? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, now, also given your pretty extensive experience living in Alamance County as the Alamance County Republican Party Chair, what kind of candidate have you observed can win in Alamance County? Well, um, I think a lot of it just relates to the, uh, how local the candidate is. You know, as, as Tip O'Neill used to say, all politics is local. And um, we had a particular race in uh, 2018, whereas most of the Republicans, or really all of the Republicans in the county, tended to win by nine or ten points in their race. The, um, in this particular race uh, that was countywide, it was for a superior court seat. And the Democrat in the race, uh, his name was Andy uh, Hanford. The Republican was Pat Nadolsky. Mr. Nadolsky had been a, a, um, a Democrat uh, previously and had switched to become a Republican in 2015. Uh, in 2010 and 2014, he had won two other countywide elections as district attorney, although they were close. And I just think there were a lot of Republicans who just never really warmed up to Mr. Nadolsky. Um, and he's not originally from Alamance County. And um, whereas Mr. Hanford is from Alamance County, he has deep roots in the county. Um, and I think just overall was generally a, uh, a better candidate. And there were a lot of Republicans uh, that worked to help elect him to office um, in a lot of precincts that generally they pretty strong Republican, Mr. Nadolsky performed, I mean, like eight to ten points less than a lot of other, than, than the other Republicans um, in that race. And he ended up losing by, I think, um, two or three points. And do you know whether statewide Democratic candidates have had any success winning House District 63? Yes, those particular precincts, um, actually in 04, 08, and some of the other uh, uh, in 2010 have, have voted for both Republicans and Democrats at the state level for Council of State and in the U.S. Senate. Okay. Now, I want to shift focus to your state house district. Um, which state house district do you live in? District 64. And who is your representative in District 64? Dennis Riddell. And is he a Republican? Yes. Was he your preferred candidate in the 2018 election? Yes. And did you vote for him in the 2018 election? Yes. Um, can you point out for the court where on this map you live, which precinct? Yes. Um, it is, am I able to do it with sure, my, go ahead. my finger? Okay, so it is 03S, which, and I think I, li I live right about Actually, right about just above where that arrow was pointing is about where my apartment is. Okay. So O three S. O three S, which is also uh, known as the South Boone Precinct. Okay. It is known as the South Boone Precinct. Uh, Mr. York, do you like your house district? I do. Why? Um, I think it generally keeps you know communities of interest together. I think that if you look at the northern part of the district and the southern part of the district. They're both very rural, very similar to each other in that regard. Um, it also keeps the entire um, municipality of Elon together, the entire municipality of uh, the village of Alamance together, and so um, I think it's a good district. Okay, and actually if we could pull up uh, Plaintiff's Trial Exhibit 312, which has previously been admitted. <coughs> Um, and do you recognize this map, Mr. York? Yes, sir. And what does it appear to be? It appears to be a map of the municipalities in Alamance County with the uh, house districts overlay. And does this, this kind of help illustrate what you were just talking about, about keeping your um, keeping municipalities whole, communities of interest whole? Yes, every municipality here is whole with the exception of Burlington and Hall River and, and um, uh, from looking at however there's one little piece of yellow up there um, that just happens to cross over into another precinct it was not uh, it just happens to cross over another precinct the and then Burlington is split so generally speaking your house district respects municipal boundaries <coughs> yes um, can we go back to the previous map um, exhibit 25 and zoom in um, on the left uh, side of the map uh, right near where his precinct is. 
Um, are there any split precincts in your house district, Mr. York? Uh, yes, I believe there are three. Okay, do you know anything about the effect of any of those splits? Well, I can tell you for O3C, uh, which if, you, if you're looking on the map here, you'll see the word Elon right there, <coughs> and just to the right and below that you see 03C. Um, that precinct is called the Central Boone Precinct, and it is split. Um, if you'll see, and it's hard to tell, but just to the left where you see the word 03N, and you look just below that, you see this little piece that kind of comes up and that. Um, that is part of 03C, and it's also a part of the municipality of Elon, and so I believe that that's why it's split that way, to keep Elon whole. Okay. Um, now, if we could pull up Plaintiff's Trial Exhibit 313. Mr. York, do you recognize this? Yes. What does it appear to be? Uh, a map of uh, Burlington with the house districts overlaid. Okay, and you see U.S. Highway 70 is highlighted there in purple? Yes, that's Church Street. It's called Church Street? It's called Church Street, yes. Okay, do you travel on Church Street frequently? Oh, yes, it's a regular, you know, it's a regular road traveled by a lot of folks in Alamance County. Okay. Now, Mr. York, I'll tell you that one of uh, plaintiff's experts, Dr. Cooper, discussed this map in his testimony last week because he wanted, quote, to give everyone in the room a sense of what this feels like for the voters, end quote. Can you tell everyone in the room whether you, as an actual voter and political activist in Alamance County, are thinking about which state house districts you're driving through as you're traveling along Church Street? No, I'm, I'm just thinking about where I'm going. Okay. Is it odd to you that Church Street would cross over district lines at various points? No, actually Church Street borders, um, there are several <coughs> precincts that might border um, on either side of Church Street, so that's not strange. Okay. And are you aware of anybody complaining about being confused as to which house district they're on as they're driving along Church Street? No, sir. Uh, we can take that down. Um, now switching gears again to your Senate District, can you say which Senate District you live in? Yes, Senate District 24. And who is your state senator? Rick Gunn. And is he Republican? Yes. And was he your uh, candidate of choice in 2018? Yes. And did you vote for him in 2018? Yes. Um, are you familiar with the contours and makeup of your state Senate District? Yes. Um, if we could pull up Intervenor Defendant's Trial Exhibit 24 for demonstrative purposes. Um, now, Mr. York, uh, is it your understanding that Alamance <coughs> County is in a county cluster with Guilford and Randolph counties? Yes. Okay. Do you like your Senate district? I do. Can you explain why? Well, to begin with, the entire county of Alamance County is, is included in there. Um, and then this part that's on the western end, which is in Guilford County, is, is very much similar to the um, western end of, of uh, it's eastern end of Guilford County, and then it's the <coughs> western end of Alamance County. But, uh, but that area is very similar to uh, the western end of, of Alamance County in that it's kind of rural, or I would say culturally similar, just uh, the areas are similar. Um, and so, again, given your experience, does this district make sense to you for reasons other than politics? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, uh, finally, I just want to ask you uh, what your understanding is of what the plaintiffs are seeking in this lawsuit? I think the plaintiffs ultimately would like to see that the maps uh, are currently in place be redrawn uh, in a manner that is more beneficial to Democrats. Okay. And if the plaintiffs are successful, do you think it's possible you'll be less likely to be represented by a Republican? Well, yes, because if you were to draw maps, if one were to draw maps that ha uh, were more beneficial to Democrats than they are currently, then by default I would be uh, less likely to be represented by a Republican. Okay. And so, uh, finally, why did you agree to intervene in this lawsuit as a defendant? Uh, because I don't agree with the, the plaintiff's arguments. Um, uh, Ultimately, I think that the maps should be drawn by the legislature, and that's who's tasked with drawing the maps, and um, that's why I'm an uh, intervener defendant in this lawsuit. Uh, I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Cross
Good afternoon, Mr. York. I'm uh, Bill Perdue on behalf of the plaintiffs. We met at your deposition, didn't we? Yes, sir. Um, so you testified on direct examination um, uh, about um, candidate quality issues in um, HD uh, 63, is that right? Yes, sir. Um, you don't believe that candidate quality is the only factor that determines the outcomes of elections, do you? No. Elections are complex. That's correct. And one of the factors that can go into uh, determining the outcome of elections is the district lines, is that right? Yes. Um, and the, the House district lines in Alamance County were last drawn in 2011, right? Yes. They were not redrawn in 2017? No. So there have been four House um, general elections under these lines, 2012, 2014, 2016, and 2018. Is that right? Yes. Um, so overall, some of those elections were good years for Democrats and some were good years for Republicans? Yes. Um, let's look at HD uh, 63 first. Um, Republican candidate in all of those four elections I, I, I listed, the Republican candidate won. Is that right? That is correct. And in HD 64, in all four of those elections, the Republican candidate won. Is that right? Yes. Now, you talked about um, the 2018 election in HD 63 in particular. Um, I believe you testified that that was a close election. Yes. It was decided by less than 1% of the vote? Yes. Um, and so uh, the Democrat, Erica McAdoo, she received more than 49% of the vote? Uh, I don't remember what the exact percentage that each person won. I believe the difference was right around 1% because the, the, the <coughs> difference in votes was right around 300 and there were just over 30,000 total votes in that election. Um, but you don't believe um, Ms. McAdoo was a, was a high quality candidate? I don't. Um, but she, you would agree with me that she won, um, well she got within 1% of winning in a district that uh, Democrats have never won under the current lines. Yes. And that's in a, in a county that has never elected a Democrat to the state house under the current lines. That is correct. Um, so whatever factors play a role in determining the outcome of elections, um, they wouldn't have to change very much to have changed the outcome um, of HD 63 in 2018. Is that right? Could, could you repeat the question? The general election in HD 63 in 2018 was close, right? Yes. So whatever factors determine the outcome of elections, they wouldn't have to change very much in that election to have changed the outcome. Is that right? Uh, every election is its own unique election, so um, we'd have to, I'd have to, we'd have to examine what every single factor is uh, in general. Whatever the factors are, they, they only have to change the margin by, by 1% to have, to have changed the outcome. Is that right? Yes. And one of the factors that goes into determining the outcome of elections is the legislative lines. Is that right? Yes. Um, you talked about um, the Senate district you live in, Senate District 24. Is that right? Yes. That district was redrawn by the special master in 2017. Isn't that right? Yes. All right. You talked about your House district, House District 64. Is that right? Yes. Um, you talked about um, the extent to which it preserves municipalities. Is that right? Yes. The extent to which it preserves communities of interest? Yes. The extent to which it splits precincts? Yes. Um, but you're not offering any testimony about the intent of the map drawer when it drew the lines for HD64, are you? That's correct. Because you don't personally know anything about the intent of the map drawers, is that right? That is correct. You were not personally involved in the redistricting process in 2017? I was not. Same in 2011? That is correct. So you don't have any personal knowledge about why the General Assembly really drew any of these lines in the way that they did? That's correct. So the extent you were suggesting a reason for why these lines are the way they are, you were guessing? Well, I don't know that I, su I suggested a, a reason for why they are. I just stated that I like my House district and that I like my Senate district. So you weren't offering a reason? I was not offering a reason. And if somebody interpreted your testimony that way, they'd be misinterpreting it? Uh, I suppose so. You mentioned that you're a, a government official, is that right? That's correct. You're the town clerk of the village of Alamance? Yes. As the town, as the town clerk of the village of Alamance, you interact with members of the public? Yes. 
For example, you interact with people who come to town hall to pay their water bills. That's correct. Um, and when you interact with people to, who come to town hall to pay their water bills, there are times when you know whether the particular person you're talking to is a Republican or a Democrat. That's right? Yes, there, there are uh, residents that uh, happen to know their political party. Um, but regardless of whether they are a Republican or a Democrat, you treat them the same either way. Is that right? Yes. You don't discriminate against Republicans or Democrats. Is that right? That's correct. You do not discriminate against Republicans or Democrats based on their partisan affiliation. I don't, I don't discriminate against anyone that um, comes to the town hall or that, that engages in any business with the town. Um, I don't make decisions or do anything in regards to their party affiliation doesn't play a factor in that at all. And their voting history doesn't, doesn't play a role either? No. Their political views doesn't play a role either? No. And one of the reasons you don't discriminate on those bases is because that's your job, right? That's correct. In addition to it being your job, another reason you do not discriminate on those bases is because you believe that that is what the law requires. Isn't that right? That's correct. And in addition to, in addition to it being your job and, it, and you believing that's what the law requires, another reason you do not discriminate against Democrats or Republicans is because it's just the right thing to do. Isn't that right? Uh, that's correct. No further questions. Cross-examination by Let's see, the uh, legislative defense. Uh, no, Your Honor. All right. No, Your Honor. All right. Redirect, Mr. Pinto. Yeah, very briefly, Your Honor. Um, Mr. York, you were asked several questions about um, the effect of the district lines uh, on election outcomes. Um, you were asked about uh, the race that Ms. McAdoo ran in 2018. Um, are you aware uh, that Ms. McAdoo is running again in 2020? Oh, actually, I, I just found out this week she is not. There's someone else running in that race. Okay. Then I will withdraw the question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You may step down. further evidence for the defense? Yes, Your Honor. We'd like to call uh, Dr. Thomas Burnell. My name is Thomas Brunel, uh, and I'm a professor of political science at the University of Texas at Dallas. B R U N E L L. Your Honors, we are, I think we're passing out some uh, exhibit binders. Do you have one? Uh, there are a lot of binders here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have the right one. <laughs> Can I approach? Could you take this one back? Yeah, this might Can be good. Yeah, that is uh, this is a copy of my CV and is this current to date uh, uh, you reasonably so I don't let me see there might be one other publication that's forthcoming but um, it's very close if there's there may be one thing missing but and so first can we just start with your educational background 
Sure. Um, I got. Uh, I received a, a, a BA, uh, an MA, and a PhD, all in political science, and all from the University of California at Irvine. And you're presently a professor, at uh, University of Texas at Dallas. That's correct. And that's a tenured position at the university. It is. And so, I'd like to talk first about the specific classes that you teach and have taught. Is there a part of your resume that speaks to your teaching experience? Possibly page 15? Yes. And can you just briefly highlight to the court your various classes that you've taught over your long career? Sure. Um, so I've taught uh, the introductory classes uh, at the uh, usually to freshmen um, about uh, the U.S. government and also Texas government. In Texas, there's actually um, a law that requires all public university students to take a full year of government, um, and that's because they want us to spend a semester on Texas government because Texas is that important uh, to Texans. Um, and uh, I also teach classes on political parties and interest groups, the U.S. Congress, um, American political institutions, um, my boutique, quote unquote, boutique class is a class on race and redistricting uh, that I teach at the undergraduate level. Um, this is a class that I really like teaching um, and usually doesn't draw a lot of students. Um, and so oftentimes the administration um, doesn't like us teaching these classes uh, because we don't, we're not packing them in. Uh, but actually last time I taught this, usually I get like 12 or 15 students. Last time I taught this, I had like 50 students. Um, that took it um, and so I don't know if it was because it was at a great time you know Tuesday Thursday at 1 p.m. When, when they were awake you know the small window when undergraduates are awake um, or um, because they because uh, um, redistricting had kind of come into the to the um, uh, the public uh, consciousness more um, or, or maybe it's because I'm such a spectacular teacher that could also that could also be it such interesting trials as this being broadcast on TV. Yeah. Drawing right. larger crowds. That's right, exactly. Um, so when I teach a lot of these same classes at the upper, um, both to master's students and to PhD students, um, uh, uh, and there's some specific things there. I, I do teach a, a graduate seminar, um, and this is not to law students, but I teach a graduate seminar to social science graduate students on election law. Um, and uh, which we, we cover redistricting in that, of course. Um, and I've taught um, statistics, basic statistics, and, um, and uh, electoral systems. And can, can we briefly talk about some of your journal articles? I believe if you look at page two, uh, it begins a few pages, maybe not so few, pages of your journal articles. When you say journal articles, are we talking about peer-reviewed? Yes, all of the journal articles are, are peer-reviewed. I have a, sec a separate section for non-peer-reviewed articles. And are many of these about representational issues and redistricting? Yes, absolutely. And can you just highlight that what you view to be, I'm sure you love all of these, as, <laughs> as everyone loves their own articles, but are there ones that you'd like to point out on the subject of redistricting specifically to the court? Um, sure. Um, Let's see. Uh, so the um, the article that I wrote with uh, Whitney Monzo, who was one of my graduate students, was uh, specifically about redistricting. It was about um, a case called Cox v. Larios, uh, and it was on uh, the impact that that decision had on state legislative population deviations. Um, let's see. Um, I wrote um, an article. Um, in the case Western Law Review, um, which actually that, I don't think that was peer reviewed even though it's in this section. I don't think law review articles are generally peer reviewed. Um, but that was about, um, that was kind of, uh, it was related to the article that I wrote with Whitney, which was about the, um, how population deviations and legislative redistrictings are used um, for various things, including um, partisan, um, for partisan reasons as well. Have you written book chapters relating to uh, redistricting? And again, I would point the court and yourself to pages six and seven. Uh, yes. 
and do some of these, I'm glancing at the title, it appears that you, you have a chapter with Bernie Grothman on redistricting. Uh, yes, uh, probably several of them. Um, so, yeah, we wrote about, um, Bernie and I wrote about the partisan consequences of Baker v. Carr and the one person, one vote revolution. Um, we also wrote a book chapter about evaluating the impact of redistricting on district homogeneity, political competition, and political extremism. Slow down. You bet. Um, we, Bernie and I have also written about Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Do I see a, a, a chapter, The Art of Dumb, Dummy Mander? Yes. Can you, yeah. can you, I've never heard the word dummy mander before. Can you tell us what that is? Sure. Um, so this, this um, book chapter has actually been cited quite a few times and, um, and, and actually Justice Kagan used the word dummy mander um, in, um, in the Rucho, in her dissent in the Rucho case. So this was, and Bernie and I coined the, coined the, uh, the word, right? That's probably my what best shot it, at immortality. What is a dummy mander? <laughs> um, so a dummy mander is when, so when you draw um, a gerrymander, right, it's usually the party um, that's gerrymandering that's at risk, right, because they're drawing districts that are more efficient. Um, and so um, if there's a political wave that goes against the party um, in these very efficient districts, all those districts can just, you know, go to the other side, right? And so um, we call that a dummy mander. When it sort of backfires, right? If you if you get a little bit too greedy, right, it can it can blow up in your face. Given the uh, if the political tide is big enough. And have you written a, in addition to chapters of books, have you written a book uh, relating to this subject? Yes. Can we go to page two? Is that the, do I see the title of it there? Yes. Uh, so this was published in 2008 um, with the uh, somewhat provocative title, Redistricting and Representation, Why Competitive Elections Are Bad for America. Okay. And then have you also received grants and awards? Well, let me, can I explain the book? Yeah, I was going to give you that opportunity later. Oh, okay, all right. But well, we can do it. We can do it now. Sure. What 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 was the thesis behind your book? Okay, um, so the book the book came about um, when I was um, I think I was still an assistant professor at the time. One of my colleagues was doing some research on um, on elections both in Europe and in America, um, <coughs> and he gave me this paper to read that um, he wanted to send out to one of the journals. And in it, he was showing. You know, he made this distinction between winners and losers, which are winners are just voters who voted for the winning candidate and losers are voters who voted for the losing candidate. Um, and he showed that, you know, there are uh, empirical uh, distinctions between these two groups. And again, this isn't, this isn't all that surprising. So for instance, losing voters are far less likely to feel well represented than the winning voters, right? Because the, the person that they voted for didn't win. Um, but it's sort of bigger than that as well. You know, they, losing voters um, are also less likely to trust government, right? So there's kind of a general um, feeling of distrust that goes beyond just the one particular um, election. Uh, and so one of the nice things about our, our federal system of government in America is we vote so often, right? It's very rare that you lose across the board. Right, so it's um, in, you know sometimes you can win. You might not win at one level, um, but you could win at a at a different level. And so it's not um, it's not all bad news all the time. Um, so the his thesis in my mind, um, I, I I thought that well the, this since losers since having more losing voters is bad, right? That means that there there's a real downside cost to having competitive elections, a competitive general election which of course everybody, including me, was in favor of, right? The more competition, the better at all times. And so, you know, I had this idea in my head, and, and honestly, uh, it had to germinate there for a couple years before I decided to start putting my, I, my, my thoughts on paper because it's like, you know, who's going to, who writes a book against competition? You know, everybody's for competition. Um, but as I, as I thought about it, I said, you know what, I think that, that this is a really important argument. And um, we could use the redistricting process to improve representation um, by drawing, um, instead of focusing on geography for 
um, communities of interest. We could think of communities of interest more along ideological lines, um, and we could put um, as many Republicans into District 1 and then put as many Democrats into District 2 instead of splitting them up. Um, and then we could, we could shift the focus, right? So I, I am in favor of competition. I'll say that before anybody sends me any hate mail um, who's watching on TV. Um, we shift the focus of competition from the general election to the primary election, right? So let Republicans compete against Republicans, pick the best Republican, and then the general election won't be that important. So you have very specific theories about how redistricting could, should be done or could be done, uh, and, and you're an advocate for those positions, right? Yes, in, this, in that particular book I put yeah. forward a, a provocative argument about it. Uh, 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 we could think about redistricting and representation in a different way. But in this case, you're not hired as an advocate, are you? No, 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 I'm not. You're hired to be an expert witness. Correct? Yes. Okay. So let me just go real quickly to your grants and awards. You have a, uh, if we can go to page one, I believe there's a list of various grants and fellowships and awards you received, and it flips over to page two, correct? Yes. Yeah, I received several fellowships um, uh, in 2013 and 2014 um, where I visited Australia, um, both the University of Sydney and the Australian National University in Canberra. Um, I spent my sabbatical um, in, in Australia, and then I've got several small internal grants to do various things over the years. And do you also have the opportunity to speak regularly at professional conferences? Yes. And are those often on redistricting? Yes, I, redistricting is one of my main um, focuses of my research, and so that's often what I'll be talking about at a, at a conference. In addition to your academic activities, have you also been involved in uh, redistricting litigation? Yes. And if we could turn to page 16. There's a section there that says redistricting and litigation experience. Is that, is that a complete list or just a partial list of what you've been involved with in redistricting? Yeah, I think I've missed a couple cases from it. So. Okay. so do you have a ballpark figure on how many cases you've been involved with? At 10 to 12, something like that. <clears throat> So let me just pull out a couple of them. Um, you were involved, I see at the top of page 17, Alabama legislature um, in, in 2013. Do you, do you remember your involvement there? Uh, yes. Um, I think I testified mainly about uh, racially polarized voting in that case. And did the court credit your testimony? They did. And then in, let me go over the other side, Pennsylvania congressional case in 02, do you remember testifying in both state and federal court? Yes. And did the side you were testifying prevail? Uh, yes. And do you remember, I know it's a long time ago now, whether <laughs> your side won, I'm guessing that the court credited your testimony? I don't think they, te I don't think I was credited by name in, in those decisions. Okay. Although I don't remember. In uh, Alabama 02, do you remember testifying in federal court? Yes. And did your side prevail? Uh, yes. Do you remember whether the court credited you or not? I don't think they, they mentioned by name. Okay. In the Virginia legislative case, your side prevailed? Uh, yes. Did they credit your testimony or do you remember? No, they didn't. I, the specific part of the case that I was involved in um, was dropped okay. after I wrote my report. And then let's go a little closer to home. There's a listing here for North Carolina Congressional and Legislative, Dickinson versus Ruscio. Yes. Do you remember that case? Yes. Can you tell the court about your involvement in that case? Uh, yeah, I think, I, I think so. There's been several cases um, and I've been involved um, since, since 2011. Well, let me just ask, you were involved in this case and you were also involved in the Covington matter too, I believe? That's right. Okay. Let's first talk about this case, which I believe is the state court case, correct? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Can you tell the court about your involvement in that case? You were an expert witness? I was an expert witness, and I had written 
uh, I was hired um, by the legislature to do some racially polarized voting analysis across the state um, so that they would um, be able to draw Section 2 districts. Um, what did you do? Uh, what was generally, briefly, tell us about your conclusions on your racial polarized voting analysis? Sure, that I found statistically significant racially polarized voting across the state. Your Honor, I'm no, I'm no object to this because I think it's being offered less for Dr. Brunel's background and more for substance in this case. He hasn't done any racially polarized voting analysis for purposes of this case. Uh, I think you heard uh, an effort to impeach other witnesses, specifically asking questions in regarding to their testimony. I can't imagine anything that goes to his ability to address the issues of this case and his qualifications as an expert having been a successful ex expert in a case in this jurisdiction. We'll allow the testimony solely for the purposes of describing his qualifications. Thank you, Your Honor. So the, did the North Carolina Supreme Court credit your testimony in that case to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they did. And you were involved in the Covington case, and, and that's, again, there lots of North Carolina redistricting. So I'll just use kind of the generic Covington case. I think you'll understand. Were you involved in that case too? I was. And to your understanding, did the federal court uh, credit your statistical analysis on racial block voting? Yes. But they didn't agree with the position of the state on legally significant polarized voting. Is that your understanding? Uh, that is my understanding. But they did not reject your expert view on the statistics. No, they accepted it. There's another case here listed Ohio Congressional, which I think is the Phil Randolph Institute versus Smith, uh, 2018. Do you remember that case? I do. Do you remember what that case was about? That case was about partisan gerrymandering. And what did the district court find? Uh, they found uh, against the state, they found that it was a partisan gerrymander. And am I correct that you were on the testified for the state in that case? That's correct. Okay. So am I safe to assume that the court in that case did not agree with your opinion? That's correct. They, they pointed out several things they thought I was um, mistaken on, I guess. And do you know what the present status of that case is? Uh, I believe it was unanimously stayed by the by the Supreme Court. Is it safe to say that a significant portion of your career has been focused on representational issues, including redistricting? Absolutely. And so you have. <coughs> Ray, uh, you have extensive, do you have extensive experience in election data, statistical analysis of district plans? Yes. I would offer to the court Dr. Burnell as a political science expert on representational uh, and redistricting issues. Any objection? No objection. Any objection from any members? Okay. His testimony will be received as proper. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like now to turn to the legislative defendant exhibit uh, 291. I'm there. Have you got that? I do indeed. Great. Can you tell the court what that exhibit is? Uh, yeah, this is my expert report for this case. And do you remember when you were contacted first to begin working on this report? Uh, not specifically. It was sometime, uh, I think the, the report is dated like the end of April, yeah, April 30th, and I think I had four, four or five weeks to do it, so I was probably contacted sometime in March, but, uh, but I don't remember specifically. And did that time frame that that limited time uh, limit the number of issues you could address in the report? Of course. But are you confident that you had sufficient time uh, to address the issues that appear in your report, in the analysis in your report? Yes. 
So were you asked whether North Carolina should have a partisan or a nonpartisan redistricting process? No. And so you understand, am I correct, that you understand that yours is an expert function, not an advocacy function? That's right. Okay. And what were you asked to do? Uh, I was asked to read and respond to the expert reports of professors uh, Cooper, Pegden, Mattingly, and Chen. Should, can we turn to page two of that exhibit? You were not asked to opine, let me first ask the question, were you asked to opine as to whether or not this particular plan was a par gross partisan gerrymander? No, I was not. And were you asked to opine on whether or not there should be proportional representation in the state of North Carolina? I was not. And you were, were you asked to opine on whether or not there should be competitive or non-competitive races in the state of North Carolina? No, I was not. So let's go to page two, and you're, you have a little section talking about general <clears throat> considerations. So can you just tell us the general considerations you started with in, in reviewing those other expert reports? Sure. Um, so as everybody by now knows, um, three of the four reports use some sort of um, simulation technique um, to, uh, to try to determine if the enacted map was an extreme partisan outlier or not. Um, and I think all three of the reports um, are flawed at a very fundamental level. Um, and that flaw is that the comparison group that, that needs to be used is not nonpartisan districts, which is what they use, but it should be partisan districts. Can, right? can I stop you for just a second there and ask if we can turn to defendant's exhibit 07. It's the next tab, I believe, in your binder. Yes, I have it. Yeah. Do you recognize what that is? Yes. Okay. And what is that? This, these are the, the specific criteria for the 2017 House and Senate plans. Okay. And did, am I correct that you understand this to be uh, guidance to the legislature in the adoption of the 2017 plan? Yes. Okay. So we'll be flipping back and forth, I think, during your discussion to this section. So I thought it would be useful to bring it in now. So let me go back to your discussion of what you thought to be. First of all, let me ask you the question. Is the redistricting process in North Carolina a partisan process? Yes, it is almost everywhere. And when legislatures adopt plans across the country, you're familiar with the process. When legislatures are assigned the process of drawing plans by legislature, by the state constitution and state statute, absent a state constitutional provision or state statute prohibiting, do they all consider politics? Yes, they do. They all consider partisan politics? Yes. They all consider election data? Yes. So the, is the North Carolina consideration of politics in this partisan process in any way an outlier in comparison Objection. to other states. Objection, Your Honor. There's nothing about this in the report. And it talks extensively about about this process throughout its whole report. Does it talk about it in comparison with other states? Um, you know, let me withdraw that question for this moment, and I'll come back to it and save us time yes. <laughs> before lunch. Yes. <laughs> so let me go through the question of how you believe the simulations are not fair comparisons to other the process in the state. Yes. So um, again, the I think you dis you discussed that beginning on page two and over to page three. Correct. So 
Do you want me to? Sure. Okay. Walk through. We can do the partisan part, then talk about the other issues where they're, they're different. Absolutely. So uh, the, in order for these simulations to be useful, in my mind, um, the, the algorithm needs to draw um, partisan, specifically it needs to draw partisan plans, right? Because remember, we're trying to find an outlier to whether or not the North Carolina plan is an outlier, right? An, an extreme partisan gerrymander. You can't compare the enacted plan to nonpartisan plans. Of course they're gonna be different. The only conclusion that I think that the court can draw based upon the comparisons as done is that partisanship played some role, and that's it, right? We, we need the comparison to be to other partisan plans, and only that, right, can we figure out, is there, is there too much partisanship in this, right? So I have a, an analogy, right? So let's say that um, I, I fancied myself a, a pretty smart guy, so I decided to take an IQ test, and I got 100 on the IQ test, but I had no idea what this meant. Okay, and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to place myself among other people to see how, how smart I was. And so I do some research online, and for some reason, inexplicably, I find a, a report where somebody uh, gave an IQ test to a thousand chickens. Okay, and the chickens, on average, scored 25 um, on this IQ test, and some were smarter, right? And they scored a little bit better than 25. Some were a little less smart, and they got less than 25, but the average was 25. Right. So now, when you compare my score to this distribution of scores from the chickens, we, don't, we still don't know how smart I am among other people. The only thing we know is that I'm smarter than chickens. Okay, and so that analogy is exactly right for this, what the simulations have done as well. Right, you can't, the comparison group is not the right comparison group, and you can't draw the conclusion that needs to be drawn. And there was no evidence that I saw offered by the plaintiffs that would give the court any guidance on how partisan this plan is, one, and two, what the standard ought to be for when it's too partisan, right? So, and those are the two critical things the court needs. Um, and, and they- yeah, I'm gonna object again to this. This is not expert testimony, it's legal testimony about the standard that the court should use. This is exactly what appears in here. He's giving, your, he's giving you his expert opinion, and as obviously he's an expert, as we all know, on how to make comparisons between partisan plans and partisan plans and saying that, in fact, comparing a partisan plan to a nonpartisan plan is an apple to the orange. It fundamentally is an expert opinion. Objections overruled. We'll, we understand that some of the testimony goes to ultimate issues of law for the court in this case, but we're accepting uh, expert opinion on circumstantial evidence that may inform those decisions. And, and Ken, looking at page three, I think there were other, in addition to simply a, the sort of fundamental starting point problem, you had some more detailed problems in regards to these reports. <coughs> Excuse me, yes, so. And this might, we might now look at plaintiff's exhibit one, page three. We could bring up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, page 3. And if we could highlight right at the very beginning the first three lines of that. And if you can see that, then your eyes are better than mine. Better put my glasses on. But if you could. Just begin with our program and read to the end of that sentence. Sure, this is from Professor. This is from Professor Chen's report, and he's describing his algorithm. And he says that the computer simulations are programmed to optimize districts with respect to various traditional districting goals, such as equalizing population, maximizing geographic compactness, and preserving political subdivisions such as county, municipal, and precinct boundaries. And in your opinion, what is the, the first traditional criteria that is missing from the, is there a traditional redistricting criteria that's missing from this list? Yes, incumbency, uh, protection of incumbents. And can we 
flip over for a second to Legislative Defendants Exhibit 07. That's the next tab in your binder. And it, do I see on that House and Senate criteria, do I see a provision regarding incumbency protection? You do. Can you read that briefly to the court? Sure. Um, reasonable efforts and political considerations may be used to avoid pairing incumbent members of the House or Senate with another incumbent in legislative districts drawn in the 2017 House and Senate plans. The committees may make reasonable efforts to ensure voters have a reasonable opportunity to elect non-paired incumbents of either party to a district in the 2017 House and Senate plans. Is that uh, a standard articulation of that particular traditional criteria? Uh, it, sort of, yeah. Okay. And so looking at page three, you, you talk extensively about incumbency protection and how it seems to be noticeably missing from Dr. Chin's simulations. Could you explain uh, what you mean by that? Sure. Um, incumbents, most incumbents, of course, want to keep their seat. Um, and uh, they're all very interested in what happens in the redistricting process. And they all have um, uh, They all have an ideal district in mind, right? Here's what here's what I would love to have um, uh, in after my district gets redrawn, and it's going to differ from person to person. You know, some of them might want to keep their exact district, some might want to add new parts to their district or get rid of parts of their district, but they all have um, an idea about what they want their district to look like um, after redistricting is over, um, and so this is a very standard thing um, for. Um, for whether it's legislative, uh, a legislative body redrawing a map or sometimes courts are redrawing maps is to protect the core of districts, all right? And it, I, I think it makes sense theoretically, it's sort of the, these are people that have all been duly elected by the people. And so kind of just getting rid of them by artful line drawing doesn't see, isn't really a good thing to do. And so I think they, I think they do have a legitimate small d democratic claim to preserving the cores of their districts. Is that basically the concept that, that the voters should be, uh, the elector should, the members should be voted out of office rather than drawn out of office? Yes. Is it more to that than just, I will represent to you, and I'm sure if I'm wrong, that it would point out to me, that Dr. Chin seems to take the position that Incumbency protection is simply avoiding the pairing of incumbents. Is that your understanding of incumbency protection? That's not. That's part. That's part of it, but it's not. That's not all of it. Is that? Do you, you think that your broader definition is closer to the broader political science understanding of that issue? Yes. Do you? you can you find? Did, were, were you able to discover anything in this simulations that seem to reach this broader issue? No, they don't. They just avoid pairing. And is core protection important? I mean, these plans have to be passed by a legislative body? They do, yes, absolutely. You need to get a majority vote. Important to protect incumbents to get the majority vote? Absolutely. But if you had a nonpartisan process, you wouldn't have to care about that, correct? True. Let me skip on down to the middle of page four. And you've got a paragraph that uh, talks about a, a difference of it. Can you just explain to the court what your criticism is of the simulations in this paragraph? Yes, they, they don't consider. If, if you're about to talk about the paragraph about race, I am going to object to that testimony. The, and the issue is not Dr. Burnell's qualifications to talk about race, but the fact that he has done no expert analysis of race. This paragraph, the three sentences that you can see here, is the entirety of his discussion of race in his report. It contains no facts or data. It is not the product of any methodology, much less a reliable one. 
Um, Dr. Brunel acknowledged in his deposition that he conducted no VRA analysis for this case. The defendants had another expert who did conduct a VRA analysis and they chose not to offer his testimony and we don't believe that the analysis that Dr. Brunel provides in his report is reliable expert testimony with respect to the VRA. Uh, well, the testimony he's going to provide is that the simulations didn't look at these issues. So it's really the broader notion of the whole concept of creating a redistricting plan and then after the fact not considering voting rights issues. So his, the fact that he didn't do the simulations isn't the point of what he's going to testify to. He's going to say that this is North Carolina. When you draw a plan, after you draw the plan, you need to look as to whether or not it complies with the Voting Rights Act. These simulations made zero effort to do that. It's not a question as to whether any plan violated the Voting Rights Act. It's whether these trillions of plans vo violated the Voting Rights Act, and we have no notion about that. And it's more complicated than simply the notion of whether or not somebody did a retrogression analysis or not, or a homogeneous precinct analysis. So that's what he's talking about here. He's saying they didn't do it, and logically, as everybody in this courtroom, I think, knows that this is North Carolina and you need to think about the Voting Rights Act when you're drawing a plan. That's the whole universe of his testimony. Yeah, if I may respond briefly. Um, the, the conclusion that Dr. Brunel reaches, which is that some, she says in the report, that some unknown number of districts in the simulations are unsuitable due to noncompliance with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, he just can't draw that conclusion without having done an analysis of the jingles factors. He hasn't done that analysis. And I would also add, Your Honors, um, that in addition, um, although we think the fact that he hasn't done the analysis is sufficient to exclude this testimony, we would take the opportunity to take up the court's invitation to re-raise our motion to uh, preclude this sort of argument or evidence from the legislative defendants on the basis of judicial estoppel because, as the court knows, the legislative defendants took the position that the um, VRA did not apply and that they, there was no need to consider racial thresholds in districts when they drew these plans. That is, that is absolutely wrong. They, after the fact, these plans, they were not during the drawing of the plans considering race. After the plans were drawn, then race was considered in the process. I think uh, we sustain in part and overrule in part uh, to the extent that this expert examined the underlying coding or variables that were used in the analysis performed and can testify that there was no variable or analysis based on race in the simulations that would be permitted to the extent that he is speculating without analysis. Uh, as to whether the maps are compliant or not compliant, that would be uh, sustained. Okay. Gee, I'm, I'm just looking at the time. I'm wondering whether you wanted me to go on or not. We are going until 1.15 oh, okay. this afternoon. Sure. Let me skip over those questions and then go to, and, and I'll, I'll loop back. Let me go to the next paragraph. You have a generalized discussion of something called the uniform partisan swing. I think the courts heard some about that, but can you just describe what you're talking about in that paragraph? Sure. Uh, the uniform partisan swing is a, a traditional tool used by political scientists in um, redistricting, uh, evaluating redistricting plans. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's very useful, but the, my point here is that it does come with baggage. Um, the, when we're trying to, to evaluate how a map, sometimes even a proposed map that hasn't had any elections, we need to try to simulate what, what might happen under different scenarios um, to get a feel for um, how it treats 
both of the parties in terms of the allocation of seats based upon different vote shares across the state. Um, and so the way that we do this, as you guys, uh, as the court undoubtedly knows, um, is that we increase and then decrease um, by usually by one percentage point across all the districts and then evaluate how many seats both parties win. So the assumption, of course, the assumption of this uniform partisan swing is clearly wrong, and we don't know how wrong it is. Um, but, uh, but again, so it's a useful tool, but it's not, right, this isn't perfect. It is making some assumptions that are, that are wrong. Yeah, and it's one of those wrong assumptions, the, the difference between, say, partisan votes statewide versus local elections. Sure. Yeah, there can be big differences in, in some states about, um, you know, how, what kind of local candidates can win and whether or not, to the extent to which local candidates, partisanship, how people vote for local candidates is affected by the national political tides. Yeah. Is that a trend you see throughout the South that, the Democratic Party is, say, stronger at the local level still than statewide. Objection, this is not contained in this report. I think it's reflected in the discussion of the problems with uniform swing. It's the fundamental problem with uniform swing is the fact that it has to be uniform. And so if the local county commissioners and sheriffs are Democrats and, and I, in fact, the local House members are Democrat, looking at whether or not Obama gets elected or not really is of limited use. I think the objection is probably more to the attempt to uh, look at a broader group of jurisdictions in North Carolina if he wants to testify about specifically North Carolina, then perhaps that might not be objectionable. Yeah, let me represent to you that there was some testimony from a member, in fact, the leader, majority leader of the House to the effect that that a local Democratic sheriff might be able to be elected to the House in a district that had numbers that looked like Donald Trump was extremely popular. Is that the problem with uniform swing simply? Yeah, that's one, one of the issues. So can we go to the next paragraph on page five? We you talk about the large number of fabricated maps. So can you tell, me, tell the court what you're talking about there? Yes, at the time that I wrote this, um, I don't know, I can't remember how many maps there were, um, but this is one of my, my major objections to simulations in general is that oftentimes um, experts, and this happened in the Ohio case too, we, we had you know uh, an expert uh, that did something similar to what Professor Chen did, but nobody had ever seen what any of the maps looked like, right? Even the, 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 the academic that produced these maps, um, I, if I remember the testimony correctly, she hadn't even looked at them, just to see, like, you know, is the computer doing what I think it's doing? Um, and do these maps look like, in any way, shape, or form, a congressional map, or in this case, a legislative map? Um, I think since then, I know I was here last week on Friday, and I saw some of um, Professor Mattingly's uh, uh, testimony. I saw some animations, um, and so I think that uh, there have been more. Uh, the court has seen more than they did at the time that I wrote this. But I think I, I really do think that's important to look at, and, and to look at some of these maps just to make sure, you know, that it passes this, the the sort of sniff test. Like this looks like uh, a legislative uh, districting map, or, or does it not? Did, uh, so it's are simply put, are shapes important in redistricting? Uh, yes. Is, did you and Bernie invent some, some type of test for this, maybe, as I remember? Oh, no, I, we didn't invent it, but yeah, Bernie Grothman used to say that, you know, whether it passes the interocular trauma test, you know, whether, whether it hits you right between the eyes or not. So as uh, your next paragraph, I think you, you sort of sum up your sort of overall issue with this type of approach. Can you tell the court what it over, sure. overall is? Um, and again, I, I meant to say this earlier, uh, and I forgot, and I, I was, uh, what, the fact that mathematicians and physicists are getting involved in these issues, I think is great. I mean, I think that taking um, uh, an approaches, um, people outside of political science bring different knowledge, skills, and abilities to the table, um, at, and they're, they, they've recognized that, that we're trying to address really important questions, and I think that's great. Um, 
but it also means that some of these relatively new technologies may not be ready for prime time yet, right? The, the simulations have only been around for a couple of years. We've only just started to see them used in lawsuits. And like I said from the, from the outset, I think that at the moment, the utility of these approaches is really, really small because they're not comparing it to the right group. Um, now, let me ask a couple broad questions. You've been involved in redistricting in, since 2000? Yes. Okay. And when's the first time you've encountered anything resembling the simulations presented in this case? I think it was in the, the last year or two, 2017, 2018, something like that. Are you familiar with any peer review, political science peer review literature that 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 is, provides a basis for for this that's been peer reviewed? Uh, well, the Chen and Rodden piece uses simulations, I think, but in terms of using it as an evaluation for partisanship, I don't think we've I don't think there have been any any such publications yet. There might be such publications in the math field. Uh, there might be. I don't know. Is it safe to assume, looking at your resume, though, you, you pretty carefully follow? So you were unfamiliar with this until very recently then? Yes. Okay. Is there any chance the North Carolina legislature would have been familiar with this when they were drawing their plans? Objection, Your Honor. I don't think the witness has any basis for answering that question. So Could they have been familiar with it prior to it existing? No. And as best you know, it didn't exist until mid-decade. That's correct. Your Honor, are we ready to break from lunch? Yes, we are. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll continue at uh, 2.45. It's an hour and a half from now. Superior choice and recess until 2.45. Mm -hmm.